Hi, Chair. Okay, um, good morning, members, and I now declare the meeting open to the public online. This is the 64th meeting, actually, of, of our Health Committee. And I'd like to welcome all of members who are participating today by video conferencing in order to maintain the social distancing guidelines that, uh, that are in place as a result of COVID-19. And I appreciate your, uh, your adherence to that. And can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? So, members, uh, no apologies have been received by the committee office. Have there been any apologies to give at this point? No, thank you. And okay, moving on then to chairperson's business. And I suppose just to start this morning with, with uh, I suppose I'm not sure if members have had a chance to hear, but there are some very concerning figures emerging this morning in relating to waiting lists for CAMS um, assessments and appointments. And I think that is clearly of huge concern. Your heart would just go out to the, the family that was featured, but every family across the North who are in that difficult situation, and some of whom, for whom the time is simply too long, and 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 they don't they don't uh, they don't manage um, to be able to uh, get to the appointment for whatever reason, and that is devastating for those families. So I wonder, what members, and it strikes me as a, as a kind of a very similar to the situation we're seeing with autism, and a lot of these services now are coming under serious pressure, and people simply cannot wait for these appointments. So. Would members be content to be right to the department um, and ask them to provide an update to the committee on in terms of the waiting lists and the missed appoint and the, the missed deadlines situation broken down by the various trusts? Um, and I think that would be very useful. We are very conscious members that we are putting a very particular focus on mental health the week after next, which is Mental Health Week, and it would be I think useful to have those figures in front of us as part of that consideration. And also just to note that we have. Um, made a particular focus of children and young people's mental health for that week, and I think that's that's a reflection of the committee's concern. And um, I think I think therefore it's very uh, relevant and important that we get those figures. So I see members' agreement with that, and thank you for that, members. The only other item today that I would have. Sure. Go ahead, Orlea. Yeah, Sorry, go I ahead, Orlea. Ask a quick question. I know that we were talking about this um, when we. I don't know if we're in closed session when we were talking about the Fort Work programme the other week. See the session that we're doing um, uh, that week, that Mental Health Awareness Week in the committee. Um, I know I had suggested at that stage about, um, you know, even trying to get representatives from the trusts to come to that session in the committee. Now I know we're going to be tight for time, but I mean, that was one of my concerns around those waiting lists. And I mean, like the figures we heard this morning on that, that interview was like, I mean, shocking around the Belfast Trust and those calms waiting lists. So I don't know if we would have any time or, um, you know, to, to, if we could slot that in. But I mean, I think it would be useful. And even if, you know, if it's the chief executives or if it's the director of the mental health services in each of the five trusts, if they maybe can't come physically to the committee, um, you know, I think that, as you said, we, we absolutely need to have that detail around the waiting lists. Um, and, and people that, that aren't being seen in a, in a timely fashion. So I don't know if we could facilitate that or if it's too, maybe it's too tight. Yeah, thank, thank you, Arlea. Um, I'll just go briefly to Clark just to check, would that be possible or has there been anything been able to be a, a arranged in relation to that, Clark? We, we will certainly have a, a look at that, Arlea. We, we have got a programme that we're going to discuss later on the forward work programme for that week, which includes um, a various number of groups, um, including the Mental Health Policy Group um, and a couple of other um, groups that have shown that, that have written to the committee to, to highlight. But I'll, I'll look at the issue of the trust. We do have the Minister up on that week as well, so we can raise that issue. But um, I, I would see what we can schedule in that week because it is it's it's a pretty full on week at the minute, um, and we'll try and get uh, and have a look to see what we can usefully add in the to that week. Uh, no, that's fair. Enough. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Elliot. Okay, thank you, members. Um, go ahead, Pam. Yeah, Chair, just to say, I completely back that call as well and what Arlene is saying. I think um, as much scrutiny as possible that we can add into this particular subject is absolutely vital. So I, I'm just 
just want to say that it, that I back that call. If we didn't get that made back to fit in, I think we should make it fit in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I think, like you know, the heartbreaking thing about this is for me is that we we constantly provide a message to say to young people and everyone else, it's okay to not be okay and speak to someone. And these 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 young kids, by and large, have spoken to someone, have reached out for the help, but the help hasn't come to them quickly enough. And I think that's a, a massive concern. Okay. Thank thank you, members. I think that we're 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 in full agreement on that. So thank you very much. Um, the only other item I wanted to flag to the uh, to the to the members' attention was a meeting that I, ha I had done this week um, in relation to health inequalities with with one of the community, the overarching community sector CDHN, and just to say that they had flagged that they would like to brief the committee at some stage in terms of their concerns around inequalities and how they're impacting out in communities. So I anticipate that they will be at some point writing to the committee to uh, to to see can they get uh, in front of the committee to brief us on the issues that they see emerging at the present time. Okay, thank you for that, member. So moving on then to the draft minutes, and I refer you to the uh, draft minutes of our meeting of the 22nd of April, which is at tab 3.1. Are members content with those minutes? Yeah, members content, uh, and uh, thank you. Are there any matters arising? There's no matters arising uh, from, as far as I can tell from those minutes. Moving on then to our first substantive briefing this morning then, members, I refer you to, uh, this is the departmental briefing on budget 2021 slash 22. I refer you there to the department's briefing paper, which is a tab 5.1 of today's pack, and to the Hansard of the previous budget briefing, which is a tab 5.2. I can advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief the committee on the department's budget for 2021-22. And I would now like to welcome by video link, uh, firstly, Miss Bridget Worth, who is finance director. Good morning, Bridget. Are you able morning, to hear us? Good morning, Chair. Yes, I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Yeah, and we're hearing you there as well, Bridget. Thank you. Good. We, we are also joined by Mr. David Keenan, who is head of financial planning. Good morning, David. Uh, good morning, Chair. Yeah, hearing you great there, David. Thank you. Uh, Miss Preta Miller, who is Director of Infrastructure Investment. Good morning, Preta, and can you hear us? I can. Good morning, Chair. Thank you. And Miss Kira Dolan, and Kira is Director of Transformation within the Department. Good morning, Kira, and can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're hearing you there, Kira. Yes, thank you. So, uh, to fudge your over leg, you're all very welcome to this morning's um, committee meeting. Uh, thank you for coming along, and we look forward to your briefing and to a question and answer session with members in relation to budget reissues. So, I will go back to you, Bridget, then. Can you uh, go ahead, please, and invite or, or outline how you plan to invite the committee or to brief the committee this morning on, these, uh, on this budget? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll start by making some opening remarks on the resource position, and then I'll hand you over to Preeta to comment on the capital position. Um, as ever, David and Kira are here to assist with any queries on the resource side and on, on transformation, respectively, but they'll not be making opening remarks this morning, if that's okay with you. Yes. Um, Thank you. Um, so you'll see from the paper that there has been no movement in the actual figures for the department between the draft and the final budget. We're still anticipating additional funding of 495 million and the breakdown remains unchanged. Whilst I appreciate the constraints on the overall funding position for Northern Ireland, I would nevertheless like to reiterate the point I made when I came before you in February, which is that only the 52 million of Agenda for Change pay funding has been provided recurrently. And that represents a recurrent increase of less than 1%. And just to put that in context, in the 2020-21 financial year, the department received some 400 million of additional funding, of which 344 million was recurrent. On a positive note, we've had the amount of our in-year allocation in relation to safe staffing confirmed at 20 million. And we're also expecting a further 50 million for additional costs we've identified for our COVID-19 response to be provided in year. However, both of these allocations are likely to be non-recurrent, which will be a particular issue for the safe staffing allocation, which is mainly needed to fund staff pay and hence will represent an ongoing cost to our budget. 
As you'll be aware from my previous briefing on the draft budget, we're also dependent on non-recurrent COVID and transformation funding to mitigate recurrent pressures that were previously included in our requirements to maintain existing services, to meet some new inescapable pressures and to fund some of our new decade new approach priorities. Whilst we've restricted the amount of non-recurrent funding we've used in this way to around £250 million, with our estimate of pay and price inflation running at around £150 million, we will require an additional £400 million above our current baseline in 22-23 just to stand still. And when I say stand still, I mean continue to deliver a health and so social care service that has waiting lists that were recently described by the Minister as dire and appalling, and where we're unable to meet the growing needs of our ageing population. Turning to the detail of the paper of what the allocation will be spent on, it's important to recognise that many of the things highlighted in the paper as funded were already being delivered at 31st of March 2021, but using non-recurrent funding. So whilst the spending is additional to our existing baseline, in many cases citizens are not going to see any additional services. Taking, for example, one of our transformation projects, multidisciplinary teams in primary care, under NDNA transformation in your paper, you see an investment of 22 million. You could be forgiven for thinking that this will significantly expand our delivery of this service model into new areas. In fact, this is just needed to continue the service we were delivering from last year's non-recurrent transformation funding. So effectively, if we'd not received this funding, we would be looking at having to scale back what's already there. And that's the challenge we face with the level of non-recurrent funding we have. Every year we need that allocation plus inflation before we can even start to increase delivery. You've probably noticed that the paper I've presented you with today focuses on the positives, on the things we can do with our budget allocation. But it's also important to recognise that there are a lot of things we would like to do that this budget simply does not provide the resources to fund. The Minister has recently announced his rebuilding plans for the health and social care system, which will include strategies for elective care, cancer and urgent and emergency care. He's also consulted on a mental health strategy. Given our current financial position and the outlook for next year, it will be extremely difficult, to say the least, to achieve effective delivery of these plans. Without the certainty of additional sustained funding over a number of years, these plans will not be feasible and the improvements in vital services we all want to see will not be possible. You are all also probably going to ask me questions on whether other important services will be delivered or improved and my answers in most cases will unfortunately probably not be what you want to hear. Whilst I am naturally very concerned about the 2021-22 financial position, I'm perhaps even more concerned about the likely position in 22-23. Whilst welcome, the temporary COVID funds we've received are helping to mask the scale of the underlying financial pressures that are building up across our services that I outlined earlier. The overall impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will be felt long term whilst the additional COVID-related funding we've received will be short-term, and we currently have no sense of how these pressures will be addressed in the future. So with that in mind, I'm really not looking forward to coming back to you later this year to talk about the 22-23 budget. As I said earlier, I expect that the department will need £400 million just to pay for what we're doing today, so I know the chances of good news are slim. And on that note, I'll hand you over to Preeta to talk about the capital position. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. So, thank Go ahead, yeah. Thanks, Chair. So, the final capital budget allocation for 21-22 has been confirmed as 326.5 million. This is a welcome 10% increase on our 2021 opening budget. Within this, we've received 3.6 million of COVID capital funding. The ongoing and key issue remains the affordability of schemes in future years, and without additional resources in a multi-year budget settlement, this one-year budget again means that the department cannot commence significant new investments that will continue beyond the 21-22 financial year. This applies to investments we would wish to begin across all of our services, for example, in mental health, increasing emergency theatre capacity, investing in our emergency services, diagnostic equipment and primary community care facilities. 
The proposed allocation will, however, enable us to take forward those priorities that we regard as inescapable, as well as continuing to progress our flagship projects, a small number of critical new projects, and provide regular and ongoing investment to the Health Service and Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service for fleet and estate maintenance and ICT. There have been some changes to our profile since our February paper to you, which has resulted in the reallocation of 13.4 million to emerging pressures, of which 11.3 million has been allocated to maintaining services in order to prevent further deterioration in the estate. These reallocations are set out in detail in the various sections of your briefing paper. Um, and with that, Bridget, Kira, David and I would be very happy to take any questions you have on the information provided. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Preta and uh, Bridget. And I uh, just uh, remind all members and panel that when you're not speaking, if you can kindly remain on mute, uh, that helps with the sound quality. So I suppose a few um, questions in, in more in general terms. First of all, um, Bridget, so once again, we're looking at a, at a one-year budget, and we know that, that we know the need and, and the pressure there is on on moving to more of a multi-annual budget situation. Um, in terms of long-term planning and and that longer-term budget, what would the key priorities be, and what what plans do you currently have? So you must be forecasting, even if you don't have the budget. What are your priorities? What would your priorities be, and what are they over the next three years in in that in in what would be a more realistic budgetary situation? Okay, um, it might be useful if I hand over to Kira after making a few initial comments to talk about the sort of overall strategic planning that's going on in the department at the moment, if that's okay, Kira. Um, but I suppose from a budgetary perspective, um, I've noted in my opening remarks there that there are a number of key strategies being developed um, around cancer, elective care, mental health, um, and urgent and emergency care. And I suppose we're looking to, um, I suppose, um, ensure that we understand the level of costs that would be associated with delivering those effectively as those strategies are developed, and they would form some of the key um, planks in our financial planning going forward. Um, coming out of a COVID pandemic, we're obviously keen not necessarily just to reproduce what we had there in the past. So there's an element of needing to go back to the drawing board a little bit in terms of the future developments that we would like to see um, rather, you know, they're not necessarily the same as what they would have been before the pandemic. But Kira, um, is it okay if you say a few things about strategic planning? Absolutely, um, Chair, happy enough. I take that on. Um, yeah. Can you hear me okay? I think there's a wee delay. Um, yes, in terms of just, you know, um, prioritization for, for the next number of years, as Bridget says, you know, we, we're, we're not clear and, and we won't be clear on what the financial position is, but um, I'm undertaking a, a piece of work at the moment in terms of looking at, you know, the work that we began in transformation and, you know, and looking across, you know, what the future of the system needs to be. Um, and I am... Um, uh, much of what happened in, in the transformation space over the last sort of four or five years ha has become sort of the, um, the the building blocks of, of what we need to do going forward. And you, you know the, the the problems that we had pre-COVID are you know no less problematic. In fact, they're probably more more problematic. So um, you know in terms of looking forward and rebuild and pulling together the main um, sort of areas um, under. Uh, you know, elective care, under children's services, under mental health, under secondary care, and social work. And, you know, Chair, you, you, you know um, that there's nothing that's any more important or less important in, 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 in the space of health and social care. So I'm um, working to pull together, um, subject to the Minister's approval, a framework which pulls together the, the, the key transformation activities like the MDTs, like the day case elective care centres and many other things, with the work that we're undertaking in rebuilding, you know, we, you know, the work that we're doing and um, to review imaging and pathology and, you know, deliver mental health services to, to put together, a, you know, a, a, a framework and an action plan for the next number of, um, well, for the next year initially, and, um, you know, uh, the longer term aims will be further developed, I suppose, when we know what the financial position is going to be, what the future impact of the of the pandemic is going to be, and um, you know, uh, I suppose how far we can get with the resources we have. So, 
I'm not sure that that answered your question necessarily, but I mean, I think well, what, what began the transformation is being built on and, 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 and we're continuing to do that in, in the space of rebuilding. Yeah, and I know, and I know there are tremendous pressures on transformation, on waiting lists, and all of that. One of the things that I did notice absent from from uh, both Bridget and yourself, and, and it's an issue that's been raised by the committee before, is around the whole area of health inequalities, and and how we are addressing those significant in everything else that we're doing. So when we're when we're yeah. when we're allocating budgets, when we're dealing with transformation, how are we so? What plans have the department in in terms of budgeting? What money are being or resources being allocated to dealing with the issues of inequality? Well, do you know, Chair, I um, I thought that you might ask me on that because it's been an issue that we've been looking at as well, um, and and most recently actually discussing with the minister and the transformation advisory board in terms of health inequalities and and you know how we how we address them because we know the pandemic has had and will continue to have have an impact impact on that um, and, and just you know prior to the meeting and I, and I, was, I was thinking about this the presentation that um, we brought to the minister it was a, a presentation that the PHA had delivered um, and it said I you know health inequalities and I know that you've asked for a, a, a briefing um, on health inequalities because really the work of making life better it, it you know it is where health inequalities is looked at specifically but you know we know that the you know the causes of health inequalities are so much broader than what we deliver in, in the health service and um, you know and the presentation recently pulled that out in terms of you know the impact of employment the impact of disability the impact of you know urban and rural and um, you know where, where you live and then um, you know the, the presentation actually you know brought it home to me again in terms of you know the conditions i've got it written here the conditions in which we are born grow live work and age all and impact health inequalities and actually the um it's only 20% of, you know, the, the impact of health inequalities is determined by the health services that are there and the access to, to the care that you have, albeit that that's the really important 20%. And um, I suppose it's our well, just, job to just, make yeah, sure just, yeah, and just in relation, even 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 taking that 20%, the Department of Health here is obviously a massive uh, department in terms of budgeting. So even, even taking that 20%, what percentage of the department's resource is being allocated or directed towards dealing with these absolutely unacceptable inequalities? And uh, to be honest, Chair, I think that it, from my perspective, it would be wrong for us to say that we have a, a, an amount of money that goes towards dealing with health inequalities. Everything that we are doing should be tackling health inequalities. And just from my perspective, in terms of transformation, um, you know, delivering together. Um, is is based on tackling health inequalities. I mean, that's mentioned in, in, in delivering together specifically. So, for example, you know, the rolling out of the MDTs, there's 22 million pounds in it this year, and MDTs is a is a regional um, program which is looking to make sure that there's access to those services right across Northern Ireland. And despite the fact that we don't have the money to grow it the way we would have done. There is slight growth, very slight growth in, in, in trying to move that forward. And even last year, you know, when we were moving transformation money around and reallocation, we gave more money to try and push that out. The day case elective care centres, our regional approach to making sure that there's a regional access to day case elective care so that you weren't having that postcode lottery that we know is a problem with um, with uh, uh, health inequalities. I mean, there's, okay. there's a million pounds. Uh, oh, oh, lots of examples. Yeah. Okay. And then, apart, aside from the budget, and uh, I, I say, uh, you know, so there's not a figure identified, and I think it will be useful to to hardwire this into everything that's being done. But in terms of measuring that the funding that is being spent or making its way to inequalities, how are the department? What are the department's metrics for measuring to ensure that that inequalities are being addressed? And this is not simply increasing or drifting. What what measurements are being used? I suppose um, that's in um, the colleagues in uh, in population health and that look after making life better. We'll, we'll have those exact metrics, um, and we can come back to you on that. But again, chair, I suppose it's you know everything that we are doing should be, and uh, you know tackling those those health inequalities and those measures will be associated with the um, making life better strategy. 
Okay. Okay. I, I, I think we, I've no doubt we will continue to return to this. I think it's a, a key issue for, for the committee in general. Anyway, I'll move on because I'm keen to get to, to other members as well. Uh, in relation to the, um, the very long waiting lists that we are, we've all know are, are absolutely unacceptable and dire and, and atrocious uh, and simply must, must be tackled and, and got to grips with. But the Minister has outlined the cost of addressing the very long waiting list that we see. So can you clarify for us the amount of funding going towards this in this financial year and sort of break that down for us? And then what are the plans in future years? And that's probably Bridget, I would think. Yeah. No, thank you, Chair. Um, so I suppose in addition to um, the the provision of elective care in our trust, which, as we know, has been constrained and, and will be constrained um, at the start of 21-22. We have set aside £40 million pounds of um, our COVID funding to um, addressing waiting list initiatives um, and other elective developments. Um, and based on our experience in 2018-19, when we invested £30 million pounds of non-recurrent funding in elective care waiting lists, that resulted in around 120,000 additional patients being seen or treated. So we're estimating that in a region of 160,000 patients will benefit from this investment of 40 million in 21-22. Um, I mean, that will depend, obviously, on the case mix and the complexity of those cases, but that's the kind of scale that we're expecting. Um, it's not possible at the moment to um, forecast into 22, 23 what we'll be able to do. That, that will obviously depend on the budget that's made available to us. Um, when I've talked about about needing an extra £400 million pounds to stand still earlier in my um, opening remarks. That £400 million pounds doesn't provide any additional funding for waiting list initiatives over and above what's already available within our trusts. So we are facing into a very challenging position into 22, 23 and beyond in terms of that investment. And as I say, without the recurrent budget and the recurrent certainty of funding into the future, it's not really possible for us to plan at this stage or to give any comment on what might be deliverable beyond the current financial year. So does that suggest no planning at all, Bridget, or are you working on assumptions? Are there no. assumptions you can usually work from? It's, as I say, it doesn't mean no planning, but it means we can't make any firm commitments because we have, as I say, I think £400 million additional funding over and above what we've got this, this year is already going to be a challenging ask for the executive in the context of uh, probably a difficult budget position. Very difficult for me to say, probably difficult for colleagues in the Department of Finance to say in the absence of a Westminster allocation. But... Um, you know, so it's, it, you know, on the face of it, if we only get four hundred million pounds additional funding in twenty two, twenty three, we we don't, we won't have any more money for waiting list initiatives. And in that context, it would be foolish of us, I suppose, uh, from a financial management perspective, to make any firm commitments. That's not to say, as obviously our, our colleagues in, uh, in that area will continue to work with independent sector providers and continue to identify potential opportunities, but it is very challenging in a scenario where you're saying, well, we don't know if the money's going to be there to have those engagements in a meaningful way because, you know, people can't, people can't say, all right, well, that's fine, I'll increase the capacity in my business. Um, when we're not being able to give them any guarantee that the that, that that we will be putting patients in their direction. Okay, thank you, and uh, I, I, I guess other members may want to pick up on that. So I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. My final one then, Bridget, is around the agency, and it's linked to that issue because these are all interlinked, obviously, in terms of financial headroom. So we see another a, a figure again, a massive figure built in for agency staff and agency payments. We, I think, all agree that that's a problem and that, that the agency spending is too high. So what plans are in place, apart from budgeting to allocate to continue paying that level, what plans are in place to address it and to okay. reduce it? So um, we have 
have continued and you'll see that in, in the paper that there are a large number of financial commitments in here for additional training places um, and that includes continuing with the 300 additional nursing training places that was part of our NDNA commitments. Um, so we are continuing to train um, additional staff um, to address that position. However, um, it is a longer term um, solution. It takes time to train people. And I'm afraid you're, you are going to get the broken record again a bit. It's very difficult to, for us to put more people into training when that requires long term additional budget commitments. So I have non recurrent funding this year. I could potentially go um, and make a bid for more funding for training which is part of a big part of the solution to reducing the need for agency workers but if that if i'm given money this year with no pro promise of money next year i can't put somebody onto a training course because you know i need two three four years yeah, yeah no i i understand that but, I'm, but what i'm trying to get beneath uh, the skin of is what is the ambition of the so have the department of figure in mind as to when they would like to see or how much they would like to see this reduced by that would then convert into potential uh, funding being freed up to put into say waiting lists or, or other so are the department do the department have a plan in their in their in, their, in their, within their budgeting department to reduce agency spend? So, um, as I say, it is dependent on that supply of additional staff. And until that supply of additional staff is available to us, and, and it is around that workforce strategy um, that, 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 that will make the additional well, staff available okay. to us so that the dependency on agencies. So I suppose my answer to you is it is the workforce strategy that is that strategy. Yes, and, that, and that's key, and I, I do accept that's key. So then let me let me, let me me take it a slightly different way, maybe, maybe to make it easier. Uh, maybe I'm not sort of getting it across properly. The additional places that have been put in place now, how much will that reduce the agency? When, no, when they come on stream, how much will that reduce the agency spend by? Okay, I don't have that figure with me today, Chair, so that, that's something I, I would need to come back to you on. Yeah. Because that would then give us an idea if we want to drive down the agency spend, how much do we need to put into the, the, the training places element of it for the future? I, I appreciate I mean? that, yes. Yes, I do, yes. Okay, I'd appreciate you coming back to me with the figures. I do want to get to other members, so I'll, I'll leave it. And thank you very much, uh, Bridget and Kira, for for those answers to me. So I'll go. I'll go. I'm going to go first of all to our deputy chair, Pam Cameron. I then have Kara Hunter, Carol McKillen, Paula Bradshaw, and Jerry Carroll. That's the order I have at present in front of me there. So I'm going to go to back to Pam. Then go ahead, please, Pam. Thank you, chair, and thank you. Uh... Bridget, Bridget and the rest of the officials for your attendance at committee today. Um, obviously, there are serious concerns and grave concerns around the, the limitations of, of, of the budget going forward. And I would be very concerned around transformation or uh, the ability to transform, which is, which is really vital. Um, so I wanted to ask around um, transformation first, and that was to what, to what extent the single year um, budget is dissuading the department's amitrust um, from investing in transformative projects which may have reoccurring costs over a longer period. So that was my first question. Um, Kira, um, yeah. I, uh, yeah, sorry, Bridget. Um, I don't think um, I don't think it's dissuading the department. I think we are um, abundantly aware and, and more aware than ever before of the need to transform services. Um, you know, given the the, the aging population that we have and the um you know the, the, the need to deliver more effective sustainable services so you know we we have been on a journey of transformation for the last uh, since 2016 so you know almost five years now and you know we're continuing to commit to that work so as i said earlier um to, to the chair the you know the significant amount of transformative activity that happened over the last number of years in the areas of elective care, urgent emergency care, and primary care, you know, right across the board, we have continued to continue that program. And um, you know, even in not having the recurrent money, you know, we had the two hundred million um, in eighteen nineteen and nineteen twenty, and we've continued to make the recurrent 
scales of that despite significant financial pressures and, and we've done the same again this year and you know I'm undertaking a piece of work in terms of sustainability to say you know we know that we don't have that money next year we didn't have it this year but you know we, we managed to find it through the, the COVID recovery money you know but we don't know if we're going to have, have that next year but um so I'm undertaking a piece of work to say look how can we meet the cost of these significant transformation programs you know that are emerging now in sort of wider rebuild 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 programs um out of you know out of the recurrent funding sources that we have but i mean there's immense pressure you know and, and there's um savings plans that the, 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 the trust have to meet as well so you know it's not a it's not an easy ask but we can't step away from transformation because we know it's the only you know pathway to a sustainable service for the future so no it is challenging Thank you for that, Kira. Um, my next question was in around IVF services, um, and I want to ask if the is the is the one million earmarked for IVF as part of the COVID rebuild? Is it related to existing service provision rather than implementing the NDNA commitment for further cycles? Okay, um, I can answer that one. Um, the and, and I'm actually just um, scrolling to the part of my briefing that will give me the answer if you bear with me a second. Um, so around half of that funding um, is going to be used to fund the revised criteria that were changed in 2019. So that included expanding the age limit to include 40 to 42 year olds in line with the NICE guidance. Um, the remainder is going to be used to address the backlog in treatment as a result of the pandemic so that it, when it's possible to increase the number of cycles as outlined in NDNA, there's, there's not a backlog there already for, for women um, who want to access treatment. Okay, that's useful too. Thank you for that, Bridget. Um, and uh, another question for you is around uh, the, cancer uh, the cancer strategy. Like, how will the £5 million pounds for the cancer strategy translate into service improvements and a scaling up of accessible services for affected patients? Okay, so... Um a significant proportion of that um, 5 million is um, funding ongoing transformation projects. So transformation projects that were funded non-recurrently previously. Um, and around half of it is going towards the stabilization of oncology and haematology services. That's um, as set out in the oncology and haematology stabilization plan that I think was published last year. Uh, and that will enable a number of posts that are temporarily funded from that plan um, to be secured recurrently going forward to enhance stability in that area. Um, and there's, there's also um, funding in there for um, Macmillan um, Clinical Nurse Specialist Workforce um, for um, fit testing in primary care, although that is um, subject, I think, to the approval of the Chief Medical Officer and um, some other areas such as um, radiotherapy. And there's also a small amount of funding in there available to the new cancer strategy that's under development. So the, the, I suppose there's a there's a range of things in there that, that that five million is going to help to fund. Okay, thank you for that, Bridget. And and then my my final one, um, Chair, uh, could you provide us, Bridget, with with some more detail on how the projects were prioritised for funding, um, under the COVID rebuild pot? You know, could you tell us more about how um, those projects were identified? Yes, so um, as part of our budget planning, we had asked um, colleagues in the HSCB, um, commissioners in, in the HSCB and policy colleagues um, alongside um, Kira's team in transformation to identify um, funding needs. And actually at the time we were planning for a three year budget, so we were looking for the 21, 22 year and the two years subsequent to that. And, and that um, sort of long list, I suppose, was identified um, as part of our early budget planning and formed the basis of our bids to DOF. 
um, then when we got our funding allocation, we used that um, kind of long list to give us a sense of what proportion of funding um, might be needed in each area. Uh, and we then gave in indicative allocations to our policy colleagues and they worked with their colleagues, the commissioners in the HSCB, to look to see where they felt the priority areas were and I suppose um, Kira touched on this a bit earlier it's very difficult I suppose in in, in health and social care to to say that something is more important than something else so so we often end up I suppose funding um, part of everything uh, in a lot of cases but but it, it has really been driven by that consultation with um, policy colleagues and um, commissioners on what are the most important things to be funded in in each in each area um, so that's that's really how that prioritization has, co has come about and obviously then we would have put those recommendations to the minister for the minister to consider and and endorse okay thank you very much thank you thank you everybody thank you chair Okay, Pam, thank you. And going then to Chiara next. Go ahead, Chiara, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, panel. Thank you, Bridget, for being here and uh, other officials. Um, we had talked briefly there about our shared concern uh, at the committee around CAMs uh, and the waiting lists. They're a huge issue uh, for young people struggling with mental illness. And oftentimes what we see is uh, they're waiting for uh, an appointment in CAMs and then they must transition into adult services and they're waiting there for an appointment as well. Uh, and this can be exceptionally uh, detrimental for their wellbeing. Can I ask for clarification uh, on whether the 4.6 million detailed here, uh, which is invested to maintain psychological therapies, does that include CAMs? Um, I, I think we'd, we'd pick that up in a previous question from the committee. That 4.6 in itself um, doesn't, I think, include CAMs. Um, I think that was, um, it's, it's part, it was, it's stuff to, uh, sorry, it, it, the funding it has been in place for a number of years and it's to help people to come off benefits. So it is largely focused at, on adult um, psychological therapies, that particular 4.6 million. However, there is, there is an allocation elsewhere in, in the budget for CALM specifically. Although, again, I should stress, I, I think, it, again, it is to maintain the existing CALM service rather than us having any additional funding to allocate to it in, in this current budget settlement. Okay, thank you, Bridget. And then just off the back of that, I see that there's 3.5 million for mental health services as part of the new decade and new approach uh, transformation. Is this earmarked for particular services? Um, can you detail them? And I know myself and other members have a, um, a key interest in dual diagnosis. Um, so can you expand a little more detail as to where the 3.5 million will go? Kira, do you have the detail on that? Um, um, or I have, I have some detail here that may that may be useful. Um, so it it so there's there's three main elements to that. Um, there is um, the continuation of the regional implementation of the suicide prevention strategy. Um, so that's that's aiming to reduce the number of mental health patients su suicides um, by supporting multi professional teams in the trusts. There's um, continued implementation of um, Protect Life 2 action plans um, and there's also um, continu continuation of the Enhanced Mental Health Liaison Service which was formerly RAID which provides greater access to mental health service for patients and staff in, in acute hospitals. Um, again, I think those are three projects that um, started non-recurrently under transformation previously and are you know this funding is enabling us to continue those into 21 22. okay thank you bridget uh, very important um to save lives and um, lastly can i just ask a question around <clears throat> nurses pay increase and i know that the pay review body is still um, a report to come back and hopefully will shortly and um, like other members I'm very hopeful that it will be more um, than one percent as we have seen in other areas um, so can I ask uh, where would this money come from and has the consideration been given to allow for this in this financial year? Okay so we have a figure in here for AFC pay 
um, the 52 million and nurses pay rises would be included within that. Um, it is based on the recommendations of the pay review body. So that 52 million would, would, would be enough to deliver their recommendations. Um, should they recommend a higher amount than is currently being recommended? Um, assuming that was funded through additional funding in England, we would get the Barnet consequentials of that into Northern Ireland. The problem we have is that um, because of the way our health service is structured compared to the way it's structured in England, Barnet consequentials aren't normally sufficient for us to to meet the full cost of an additional pay rise for our staff. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's largely due to the way social care is funded here compared to England. Um, and so there would then be an additional pressure at block level um, were there to be an increased um, pay rise. Now that would obviously be something for the executive con to consider whether they would fund that from, from, from um, within the block or, or whether they would look to us to reduce some of our proposals that we've set out here today to, to enable us to fund it. So I suppose within what I'm presenting to you today, there, there isn't provision for an additional um, pay rise over and above what's currently being recommended. Mm, that's unfortunate. I, I think what we've seen, you know, over the past year within the pandemic is the devotion, the commitment from, from the frontline workers. So that's disappointing. But no, thank you, uh, Bridget, for your previous answers there on mental health. That was help uh, clarify what I needed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cara. I'm going then to Carol Nichillen. Go ahead, Carol Lederhall. So I'm just checking if Carol, Carol, can you hear us there, present? Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you now, Carol. Go right, Lana Ray. Go right. Sorry, I'm not having internet problems. So, um, so the 52 million for the pay increase, that's clear enough. But what isn't clear for me is the non-agenda uh, for change pay inf inflation at 40 million, and then the other non-pay inflation at 25 million. What, what are they to be spent on? Okay, so um, a lot of our doctors and dentists would not be on agenda for change pay scales and neither would our fire service um, and also civil servants. So the non-agenda for pay um, figures include um, provision for um, those groups. Um, I, I, there's probably some others I've forgotten and, and many apologies to those groups who, who I haven't mentioned, but it's really any of our workforce that is not on agenda for change pay scales, that that, that funding is, is for them. Um, it, um, yeah, in, in, sorry, in terms of the non-pay inflation, that is your sort of general goods and services going up in price as a result of underlying inflation rates. So, um, you know, it's 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 things that we we buy for. It's, it doesn't think. Sorry, drugs is the one that's coming to mind, but we have a separate separate provision for drugs inflation. But it's it's um, you know, I suppose everything from cleaning products to um, okay. medical. Well, Says those sorts of things. Okay, so can I just have a breakdown um, on the non, the 40 million non agenda for change pay and, you know, itemized beside each profession and then the 25 million, what the goods and services? Because I think when we're talking about nurses who are going to hopefully get an increase and then we've got this whopping 40 million, I would just like to be curious to see what the, the, the pay yes. increase is for the others. Sorry, uh, and, and that, that's, abs that's absolutely fine. We we okay. can provide that. Um, I should say some of it is the national living wage uplift for our um, care home and domiciliary okay. care workers as well. Okay, well so we're happy to happy to provide that's a breakdown. Okay, that's why I'm asking, Bridget. Okay, um, so could you tell me why there's only six hundred thousand earmarked for hep hepatitis C and contaminated blood products? What's what's that about? 
So um, that is the additional amount so that there's already funding in our baseline for um, the hepatitis C um, that you'll be aware there were additional amounts allocated in 2021. So those amounts are already in our baseline. So this is an increase over and above what would have been um, provided in 2020-21. So I am um, sorry, I'm trying to find the place in my briefing. David, do you have that to hand as to exactly what that's funding? Yeah, yep, just hold on. Yeah, that's to cover the cost resulting from back down payments for bereaved partners. This was announced in March 21. So that's cost that we've incurred in, in 2021. This is, this is now additional requirement for 2021-22 budget. So that, as Bridget said, there are that, that's additional to what we already have in the baseline. Okay, and when you say bereaved partners, David, you're you're not expecting someone to be legally married because we've already been through that. And um, I'm I'm not sure on the detail of that. Sorry, Carol. Um, but no bother. Could um, you try, try yeah, and bring yes, it back it, it, yes, it's something we could come back to you on. Brilliant. I appreciate that. And um, so under the category of other. You've got eight hundred thousand for prison healthcare. You've got two point two million for urology public inquiry. You've one point two for palliative care. There's no baseline or no figure at all for the neurology public inquiry that the minister was talking about. Um, not even an indicative figure. So what what's what's the situation with that, please? Just bear with me a second. There is there is funding in there for the neurology public inquiry. Um, we just hadn't detailed it out. We have half a million pounds set aside for the neurology inquiry, which is um, the amount that we are expecting to spend in. Um, no, sorry, that's neurology services. Apologies for that. Um, I know we have taken the neurology uh, inquiry into account in putting the budget together. I'm just not putting my hands on the exact amount. Okay, Bridget, I appreciate it. I'm happy to come back to you on yeah. that. Yeah, it's just, I want to make the point, the fact that it's not there, and which, you know, has been an ongoing scandal, okay? And we're now looking at a third recall. Um, and even given the fact that the minister had to come in front of the assembly to explain what's going on, um, and yet in all, there's no indicative baseline there. It's quite disappointing. And, and I would anticipate that it would be in the region, at least, of the urology uh, at 2.2 million. But I would just ask that you provide details. And the last question, sure, I have is regarding the um, 1 million for cybersecurity and digital health and care, and also the 0 0.7, 700 grand for nursing home inreach. So that in relation to the nursing home inreach, what, what is that to do, please? Okay, nursing home in race. Sorry, bear with me a second. Um, so that is to, that will enhance and expand the knowledge and skill of care home staff to enable them to meet the urgent and critical care needs of residents. So the idea of that is to reduce avoidable attendance at emergency departments and admission to hospital. So I suppose it, it is to enable care home staff to, uh, to be upskilled to, to better meet the needs of the clients that they're serving. And that's, that's fine, Sharon, sure, I'll finish on this. I would just like to see some detail, more detail. I mean, the district nursing figures are fine. Enhancing levels of senior nursing staff, I'm assuming that's career progression. Um, but I could, if I could see details on the enhancing levels of senior nursing staff and more details on the nursing home in reach, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And going then to Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for this morning's briefing. Um, my first question is in relation to PrEP the anti-HIV um, medication. And in March this year, um, the Department of Health put out a statement said that work continues to secure funding to support recurrent investment in PrEP. And I would just wonder where in the budget an allocation is, and if not, what's happening in that regard? That's my first question, thank you. Okay, 
I think I, I think there's uh, again just to sort of I suppose give give committee members um, a sense just of the, of the way the paper's been put together. We try to highlight some of the larger amounts and some of the key things rather than give you an exact list of absolutely everything that's been funded. There is £300,000, I think, built in here for, for PrEP um, into the overall allocation we have in our population health and um, health prevention um, area. Okay, that's, thank you. That, that, that's crystal clear. I really appreciate that. My second question is in relation to the staff, safe staffing legislation, the issue that the chair raised there around agency staff. In my constituency in South Belfast, you'll be aware there'll be a lot of people living in HMOs, etc. And anecdotally, I'm hearing that there are a lot of nurses coming from Zimbabwe. Um, and I am all for women empowerment and all, all those issues, and this is not a political statement, but I am concerned that gaps are being plugged in the vacancies for nurses by poaching nurses from from developing countries who can ill afford to lose their staff so uh, i wonder to what degree that is continuing or whether you can comment on that but probably in terms of the budget how much are the agencies who are actually bringing you know employing these nurses what cut are they taking of the money that's going from the department of health to them and then paid to these um, staff who are coming here from other countries because I would be concerned that the, the people who are most profiting from this are the agencies. Thank you. Okay. And I suppose I, I don't have the exact information that you're looking for there. And, and I, in particular, I'm not sure to what extent um, nurses from abroad are coming here to work for agencies as opposed to coming here for a career with the, with the health and social care service. Um, so, I mean, that's perhaps one that would be better to take away and, and allow workforce policy colleagues to come back on. Okay, I no, appreciate that, thank you. Um, I, I think the next one is for, for Kira. Kira had mentioned there, I think it was Kira was talking about looking at the future of how the system has to be in terms of sort of the re, uh, regional prioritization um, of the lists going forward. And I'm just wondering to what degree um, she is sitting on the regional management board and how much there's that um, read across between what is the clinical urgency that the clinicians are saying needed for the surgery and how much she's feeding in there in terms of the realism of what budget is actually available. So it's just that relationship between the departmental officials and the, the board, please. Um, yes, of course. Um, the uh, regional management board, it's, it's the rebuild management board. Um, and on it, um, Paula sits all of the chief executives of the trusts. Um, there's primary care um, commissioner, there is primary care, um, there's GP representation and surgeon representation, and then the chief nursing officer, chief medical officer, um, the uh, chief executive of the health and social care board. So the whole system is represented on that. Um, I uh, feed into the rebuilt management board um, actually next Wednesday I'm taking the, a paper on a proposed framework and action plan for uh, amalgamating the work of transformation uh, with the new work that is you know emerged out of rebuild and the COVID learning so into sort of an action plan for the next 12 months so I'm um, very much engaged and, and I work very closely with Bridget in terms of um, you know how we how we fund that what we can afford to fund and, and, and that's taken into account so um, I mean the, the, the framework you know, is a is a plan for the next twelve months that you know ultimately the minister will will, will you know have to consider and, and, and approve. But um, I mean, it's it's uh, it's an aspiration. It's it, we don't have the, the the financial capacity. We know Bridget said that out very clearly at the start, but it's no less important to be looking at what we need to do and, and having those plans in place should the money arise or or not. Okay, thank you, Kira. Maybe just as a follow-up and last question from me, Chair. Um, it's, it's in relation to the um, provision for long COVID in terms of everything from the assessment of diagnosis and in terms of the allied health professional support, etc. Have, have you got an indicative budget of what you think that will be in the next financial year? Um, and to what degree are you working with the Health and Social Care Board who are leading this sort of service um, configuration um, framework in terms of what the service will look like? Okay, um, and Paula, working... In, on developing cost proposals um, for services for long COVID or post-COVID syndrome, that 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 work is ongoing. Um, unfortunately, at the moment across the water, um, whilst they had announced that 
10 million pounds to support the establishment of clinics in England. That funding came from within their existing budget. So there haven't been any Barnet consequentials of that coming to, to Northern Ireland as yet. So as you, as you know, and as, as we've um, said today, our budget position is very constrained. So I, I can't give you really any assurances around where and whether that funding will will, will come from as yet, um, but we are we are obviously conscious of the need and are working on a, on on what it might cost. Okay, no, I appreciate that, and thanks for all the answers. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. So we're going next on our list. Then uh, the, uh, at this point in time, we have Jerry, or Leah, and Alan in that order. So I'm going to Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, panel. Um, and no disrespect to the panel at all, but uh, this budget is really unambitious, uninspiring, unmanageable, um, given the challenges we face with waiting lists and every other aspect of health, given the year people have been through. Um, it really is uh, very disappointing. And, and even the notes said um, final settlement remains extremely disappointing. Uh, I would concur with that. Uh, but I'd like to ask, what work uh, has been done or what work was previously done to challenge what has been described by the department uh, as uh, an extremely disappointing final settlement? Okay, I think it's, you know, we're very disappointed with our settlement. I think the same is true of most Northern Ireland departments and indeed I think the finance minister was disappointed with the settlement that Northern Ireland has received. And I suppose in that context, whilst we have been challenging and we have been articulating the difficulties it will provide for health, um, I'm not sure that the finance minister currently has any more recurrent funding he can give us. I think the level of recurrent funding that was made available at block level was made it very difficult. So I suppose um, I'm the finance director for health. It is my job to advocate for health, but it would be remiss of me to not to acknowledge the challenges that my counterparts are experiencing across across government at this time. Um, so yes, we continue to make the case. We, um, I suppose, it's made quite difficult in the time of COVID because, as as the chair drew out a little bit in his questions, um, we're not. We don't have a, a clear vision of what we think the health se service should look like post COVID because we're still trying to learn the lessons that we've learned from having dealt with COVID, some of which have been very useful in moving transformation on. So the service that we want to build back post COVID is not necessarily the service we had before COVID. And we need, I suppose, a little bit of space um, to take a breath to, to, to ensure that we work out what that should look like. Um, and that's why we maybe don't have the answers to hand at the moment, but very, very conscious that that work needs to be done at speed so that we are ready and prepared to make that robust case as we come into the next budgeting period. Um, and we do continue to make the case um, with the information that we do have available to us as strongly and robustly as we can. Thanks, Bridget. And uh, I suppose from my end, it's very concerning to hear, you know, thankfully yourself and others say that the budget isn't great, but no sense of a strategy to try and uh, change it, tackle it, uh, or put pressure. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, and I suppose just, just to respond to that quickly, um, I think there is a bit of, people may have different ideas, but I think there's a consensus developing that, you know, people appreciated that what the NHS did for them uh, during the pandemic. They obviously clapped for it. So whilst people may have different, um, you know, s uh, specific ideas, most people want to maintain it and strengthen it is what I'm hearing. But like I said, to move on, um, just on the, on the issue of pay, just to get a bit of clarity from previous members' uh, questions. So uh, the, I think it's the 85 million set aside say for 2021. Um, is that presumably the historical um, uh, addressing of the underpin that obviously people uh, were out in strike for? Is, can I get a bit of clarity on that? Yes, yeah, so that 85 million, um, I think actually covers 1920 and 2021 um, pay to bring um, the AFC staff up to pay parity. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify again, so currently there's there's no money uh, set aside uh, in this budget for a increase 
if you will, post-COVID, uh, the many, I mean, I, I note that trade unions are calling for, uh, some cases, 15% pay increase, some unions are calling for a £3,000 increase for their, for their members, and I'm sure we all agree they, they want that and more, but to clarify, there's no money set aside for, for that or, or figures um, similar to that in, in this in this budget. That's correct. Um, at the moment, as I say, the AFC pay is based on um, the current proposals by the pay review body and um, sim- you know, other, other pay um, levels are, are at similar, similar levels to that. Okay, thanks. Uh, just just uh, a couple of quick points there, Chair. Um, uh, and just to say that, so obviously the pay review body is constrained, presumably, by the fact that there's no extra money set aside. So there, is their offer therefore constrained uh, by, by that reality? Um, so I imagine, I don't know for certain, but, um, you know, that it will be the, the Westminster government that is, that is, um, feeding into whatever pay constraint there is on that review body, um, you know, we will we will need to see what their recommendations are. Um, but with the challenging budget we have, if we were to want to go over and above their current recommendations, it would mean that one of the one of the other things that is on this list would would either one of the things, other things that's on the list for health would reduce or that we would be going looking, I suppose, to the executive to reduce spending in another area within, you know, the Northern Ireland budget in order to fund that. Yep, thank you. Just final question. Um, elective car, £40 million pounds has been set aside. Uh, what, what's it um, presumed that that would be spent on budget? Thanks. Um, so I don't have a detailed breakdown of exactly what... Um, they I mean, would what, what I'm trying to really just to try to cut in. What I'm trying to really ask her is that um, money going to be redirected to uh, the NHS services, or is that money that will be going to the quote unquote independent sector? Um, so it is planned that that will be going to the independent sector, um, and the, the main reason for that being that um, you know we will still have constrained capacity in in the in the health sector, in the health and social care sector. Um, particularly because staff will have just have come out of a surge and they will need some time to rest and recover. Um, so there will be lower capacity in our own um, areas o- o- over 21, 22 compared to years where we've been working at full capacity. Um, so, so yes, that 40 million we expect will be spent in the independent sector. Thank you. Okay, going back to Jerry, and going then across to Arlea Flynn, uh, Lana Ray, Arlea. Yeah, Gorm, Gorm, good column, um, and thanks to the the officials for coming um, today with this um, briefing. Um, so, first of all, I just wanted to ask, maybe for for Bridget, um, can the department confirm, or has the department worked out what percentage of this budget has been spent on mental health? I don't have the percentage of the overall budget to hand. Um, of the additional allocations, we're looking at around about the thirty-eight million pound mark. So there's ten million pounds there that are from the confidence and supply mental health, and another twenty-eight million pounds then from the transformation and rebuild. That doesn't include any response funding then that would be directed towards mental health. So that's I suppose the increase on the previous baseline, um, but. We we haven't crunched the numbers yet on what that means for the overall percentage. Okay, um, uh, thanks, Bridget. And I'm just wondering, when, when you do that sort of number crunch, could you let me know um, or let the committee know? Um, so what, what share of this budget um, has been spent on mental health and on, I know Carr raised it earlier, and on CAMS. I know you were saying that there's no additional money in this budget for CAMS, but it's just to get that actual figure of what what spend is going towards mental health and first of all and then the calms that would be great if, if we could get that thank you um then my second question is around so yes i touched on the multidisciplinary teams and that 22 million which is basically just continuing on with you know the the the, the services that you have in place currently um so kira you had mentioned that that you know even within that there is a slight growth and could you maybe just elaborate on what that slight growth is within the, the MDTs? 
And then I'm also, I know Cara had touched on the 3.5 million and Bridget, you had mentioned a couple of different projects around Betrack Life 2 and the former raid service. Um, could I get in writing the, the breakdown of what that 3.5 million is? Um, and also the breakdown of the 2.5 million um, that's been spent on the mental health task and finish group. Um, I just think it would be good, it would be useful for myself to have that that detail um, around those figures. Um, and then just find me on that then. Um, the I didn't hear any mention as yet around the multi-agency triage teams that are operating in Belfast and the South Eastern Trust and the plan is obviously to have those expanded. It might fall under that Protect Life 2 funding, um, but it's not referenced anywhere specifically in your briefing paper. And I can see that 0.8 million has been um, ring-fenced or will be spent on prison health care. And can you just confirm, is that the, the custody suites, the mental health custody pilot, um, the pilot that was done in Musgrave? Okay, to take the last part first, Olia, and, and apologies if I forget some of the rest of it. Yes, um, the funding for prison healthcare is um, for Musgrave and actually potentially to expand that um, into Antrim, although um, COVID may, may delay that expansion. Um, on the MDTs, Kira, do you have the MDT information to hand? Yes, I do. Um... Just got it on screen here. One second, Orlea. Um, yes, there is a growth, a slight growth in um, MDT. So um, the the growth that was um, the amount spent in the last financial year was um, eighteen million um, in around eighteen million. There's an additional three point nine million this year, um, and that's the rollout and implementation of the current services with the, the practice based physiotherapists, with the mental health workers and the social workers. Um, but I know that this um, increase also includes the, a significant part of that investment, additional investment in um, additional nursing specialist roles, um, such as health visit and, and district nursing. And I do know there is a particular focus at the moment in mental health support through MDTs because you know we're aware of the mental health issues that are uh, that are arising. So there's a particular focus on putting in um, mental health specialists there. Um, is that okay? Yes, Kira, that that's great. Thanks very much. And see, just on the the multi agency triage team. So, is that falling anywhere in in this budget? I just looked. At it. it is. Um, let me have a, a scroll on through. What was your sp specific question on that earlier? It was just is there mental health triage team money set set aside for the 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 street triage teams? I know that there was talk about obviously the the I mean the uh, there's obviously a way to expand it right across the five different trusts we're probably not at that point looking at this this budget but is it even is the money yeah. for Belfast and South Eastern? Let me have a wee look I know that there is money for that in this um, let me have a wee look if you want to um Yes, I, 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 I mean, it might be. I mean, I know earlier there were some of those things you specifically wanted us to come back in writing. So maybe um, we could pick that up this this bit up as well, if that would be helpful. Uh, yes, no, that's brilliant, yeah. Bridget. Because Although I think I think I'm just yeah. I think I'm just finding in my briefing actually that there is um, about three hundred thousand pounds set aside for multi agency triage teams. I don't have the detail of exactly what that's funding, but it's definitely in there. Okay. Apologies, we've so many lines in this. Sometimes it's just hard to orientate okay. ourselves around it. No, don't don't be worrying. And sorry if I missed it. Um, but as I said, it'll probably come under that brief in any way with the the breakdown of the three point five million and the two point five, um, for for mental health abuse. Can give me that in writing. And then just finally, uh, maybe for Preda on the capital. Um, so I can see obviously under some of the committed projects, the Hollywell. Um, is there? It's it's progressing to the stage one design stage. It has the two point five million um, allocated towards that. But at a previous briefing, um, Preda, there was mention um, somewhere around the um, doing work um, to look into a mother and baby perinatal mental health um, inpatient unit in the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust. Um, now it was at a very early advanced stage where I think you were just sort of you know doing a business case around it or. Um, and it was only mm -hmm. a seven or eight bed. It's a small unit, but it was definitely referenced in a previous um, briefing that we had. And I'm just wondering 
is that mother and baby um, mental health unit contained anywhere within this budget or has this has that been pulled? Okay, so um, the business case um, for the six bedded regional perinatal mental health mother and baby unit, it's currently being developed basically. Um, I know uh, I know that the currently the services in Northern Ireland are pretty limited around that. Um, the location hasn't been determined, but it could far, form part of the northern or southeastern schemes or be a standalone facility at Belfast. I think CPD are currently estimating the cost of that to be around four million. We included it in a four-year budget gathering exercise to DOF in September 20 to start from 23-24. So that's where it is really. It wouldn't be part of this current budget, but it's in our long-term you know, it's on our long term sort of radar and it and yeah, the business case is being this work is ongoing on that, basically. No, that that's that's fair enough, Prada. Um, and thank you for that update. And I suppose, you know, I know that Kira and others have mentioned that you are dealing with all sorts of priorities, which are all as important as the next. Um, but just on on that particular and it would be a small unit because it doesn't impact that many women, thankfully. But nevertheless, it, it does. It is impacting all women. Currently, and there is no facility at all on the island of Ireland for a mother and baby to have that inpatient unit if a mother becomes severely mentally ill. So, um, it's just to put that point on record that it might be a longer term priority, but I think it needs to be dealt with in the more immediate term because currently there's no there's no unit for for any woman to go and she's separated from her baby, and and all the rest. So, um, but I appreciate the update that you've gave me today. So, thanks very much again to you as all. Thank you. Chair, can I um, just add one point to find the, the multi-agency triage piece for Orlea? Um, Orlea, there is um, an 85,000 growth in that this year. So um, last year there was 186,000 to it, an additional 85, which takes it up to about 272. So there's a slight growth in it, um, and you know, and, and the service is, is continuing. I appreciate yeah. that, here. Thank you. Thank you. And just just Preta to pick up slightly on that on that perinatal mental health unit. I presume a unit like that, if it's going to be regional, will take accessibility into account. So I, I heard reference to Northern, Southeastern, and Belfast, and and um, clearly people from Fermanagh, Tyrone, Derry, and indeed as Orlea has mentioned, the catchment of of the entire North, including if necessary or if beneficial parts of the twenty six counties. But I presume a unit like that accessibility for Patients and their families and visitors and all of that will be will be a, a very a central figure or factor in the consideration. Um, Colm, I'm not overly familiar um, with the process to date, but yes, I know that those considerations are looked at as part of all services. So I would, I would like to think so. Yeah, and it's yeah, in and, the and, early stages. Obviously, no location has been determined at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, and and it also it also became apparent during the neurology recall that because it was a regional service based in Belfast, it put undue and disproportionate pressure on the Belfast trust. So I think we need to consider that when we're when we're allocating. If we are transforming services, they need to be regionally balanced and they need to meet the needs of everyone. So I think that's that's critical that that we don't uh, we don't just go for you know kind of the same old same old that there's a bit of imagination and a bit of uh, coordination and cooperation. Uh, right across right across the region and between here and the south okay thank you for that so i'm going then to alan chambers go ahead alan please alan we're not hearing you we're not hearing you once again alan i'm afraid and you're not on mute here on the system alan Okay. Okay. I'll move. I'll move on, Alan. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'll move on there. So, listen, members. We do have maybe a couple of maybe maximum ten minutes uh, of this briefing. If members want to come back in with a point of clarification or another quick question, um, so uh, I, I I do have one quick question there, but I know that Carol has indicated that she wanted a bit of clarification on one of her questions. So I'll go back to Carol first, and then I'll, I'll come back. And if members want to a very quick, a very quick question, please indicate again. So go ahead, Carol quick it's primarily on the budgets 
and the budget headlines for neurology. So um, I think it you said that there was, or sorry, it says here there's additional money, or we said it was additional money for neurology services. So, uh, I mean, I, I would anticipate that you would have a, 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 a narrative for that. So is it to help with the third recall? Is it to bring additional consultants in? What's that for? Uh, and my apologies, Carol, I, I don't actually have a detailed na narrative on that one. Um, it is something I can pick up in, in, and come back to in writing, if that's okay. Yeah, if you could, um, Bridget, I'd really appreciate it because you, you will be aware that the minister brought a statement and it's it's it would it would be completely appropriate that we would get that information as soon as possible because that statement and the anticipation that there'll be a third recall has caused a lot of stress and anxiety, um, and we need as much clarification as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so a quick one then from, from me, um, Bridget, is the issue of co-production and co-design has come up frequently and we are very, very keen as a committee to see if we can uh, get that improved and get real meaningful. So in, in, in that context, what uh, budget has been set aside for consultations, to conduct consultations in this year's budget? Okay. I wouldn't have a figure for consultations split out separately, Chair. Um, any um, funding for consultation would generally be built into the budget for a particular strategy or a particular area. So I, I kind of don't have a separate um, funding line for consultations. I know I have within my briefing in a number of the breakdowns of the additional amounts money for a consultation on or money to, you know, so I, I you know, I, I am confident that um, consultation is being built into those proposals, but I wouldn't have a separate figure for consultation. It, it would be built into each of those particular funding areas where, where appropriate and where needed. Okay, and and then in in the future, is it possible that that would be that that would be available to to see you know what's being allocated to the co-production consultation type process? It, it it will be, I suppose it would be uh, it would be a, an exercise in coordination to pull that out of each of our different policy areas. But um, certainly, if if that's something the committee would like to ask for, um, it's something we can look at providing. Okay, thank you. I think it I think it will enable us to just track the progress in terms of, of improving the process of consultation, co-production, co-design, and all of that. I'm going to go back to Alan here now to see if we can pick up on Alan, and then um, if I get time, hopefully I'll go back to Pam for an additional question. But I'm going to go back to Alan in the first instance. Go ahead, Alan. Can you hear me now? Yes, hear you now, Alan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I finally found the button to press, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm delighted. Thank you. I know that we, uh, I'll be quick here, but uh, I know that uh, you can only work with what you have in front of you, and that uh, you did use the word uh, challenging uh, quite often during your presentation, but, you know, perhaps maybe some of our expectations are, are more than challenging, that they might actually prove to be uh, impossible. But in terms of uh, the, the, the point that the chair raised earlier about the agency staff, um, can you confirm that that really, to reduce that figure, it is really linked with uh, the guarantee of being able to train new staff? Uh, and to do that, you do need uh, a much more guaranteed budget than a one-year uh, budget. And the other question, uh, Bridget, is the, there has been a lot of talk uh, around about top slicing of the departmental budgets to help pay for the Troubles Victims Pension. And I think that the figure that uh, has been quoted um, for the health department is something in the uh, range of £37 million uh, a year for, I think, a period of about 20 years. Um, should this uh, uh, come to be true, that uh, your department is going to lose £37 million in this incoming year, are you going to be coming back to us with a lot more bad news? I suppose the short answers to those questions, Alan, are yes and yes. Um, 
certainly, as I, I as I had um, said earlier, in terms of the agency workers, it, it really is the workforce strategy um, and the our ability to train staff that will be a key um, driver of our ability to reduce agency costs. And as you say, any reduction in our budget will lead to more difficult choices. And I suppose the figure that you're mentioning of 37 million, um, you know, there's 40 million that we are looking to spend this year on elective care. And that's looking to see around about 160,000 patients. So, you know, if we were to lose 37, 40-ish million pounds, that's the kind of impact that it could have on the health budget. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, Mr. Sorry, Colin, you're on mute. Yeah, so going very briefly then to Pam Cameron for a, brief, a final question. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, and I appreciate the opportunity to ask another question. Um, I wanted to ask if, if, um, if you could tell us more about the allocation set aside to meet the challenges arising from the protocol in terms of disruption to medicine supply. Um, has the potential for further disruption when grace periods end been factored into this budget? Yes, so Pam, um, we have um, there's 300 million pounds specifically in our opening allocation for EU exit, um, which is funding our, our transition team. And we have been advised that we will receive around about another 350,000 pounds, I think, in year under the um, Northern, from, from Northern Ireland protocol funding to, to supplement that. We've also set aside a further million pounds from within our overall budget allocation um, to put towards this, and, and that's in anticipation of um, additional costs of the UK-wide strategy and also um, primarily to fund additional storage needs to enable us to um, increase our local stockpiles as a result of that. Um, I will be and have been talking to DOF about the potential to secure additional funding for EU specific um, issues um, and um, we're certainly looking at putting forward a bid in June monitoring um, because obviously that million pounds we have at the moment in our budget is you know, a million pounds that could could perhaps be spent on something else if there is indeed a, a separate funding pot that we can secure that money from specifically to deal with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, uh, members. And I would just like to thank then um, Bridget, David, Preta, and Kira for your attendance here this morning. For your presentation, I think it is something that we're significantly concerned about. Clearly, that that um, that there's a very challenging budget situation and a very challenging health situation, um, and that that these are are going to require massive efforts in order to deal with mental health problems, the waiting lists, the transformation, and everything that's going on there. I suppose, in terms of this morning's session, it strikes me that we do. I think need as a committee to maybe try to see can we engage with you in terms of how we might improve the process of uh, of us getting a clear line of sight and getting underneath the bonnet of some of the figures that that we're being presented with. Um, and I know and I appreciate what you're saying. You know, the, you don't want to over you know detail everything, but I I don't know if there's a way that for us to follow. There's also that additional problem that the money is allocated by the department, then goes into the HSC and for commissioning, then goes to the trusts, sometimes gets described under different headings or whatever. So it's very hard to follow. And for me, a key concern about that longer term is that it's very hard to track the impact of budget decisions. You know, are we dealing with health inequalities? Are we is there enough money going into mental health? Uh, and, and that that underspend that we know is there in terms of other regions and other areas. So, uh, so I think there is a piece of work there to see how we can, in the future, improve the uh, the ability to scrutinise into the detail of this and the impact of it. But that that is work for for ongoing work for for us all. I think to try to do that. But um, I I appreciate your attendance today. Any final words, Bridget, from yourself, or are you content with that?
Um, well, no, Colin, just to say that, you know, anything we can do to improve the clarity of the, our communication to the committee, we're more than happy to, to, to discuss with your clerk or with, with whoever appropriate to, to try and do that. I mean, we would obviously much rather put our efforts into producing information that you find useful, so more than happy to engage on that front. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that and I appreciate your commitment to provide a fair amount of additional information that members have asked for this morning. So I appreciate that and we look forward to receiving that. But for now, thank you all very, very much. And I want to wish you all good luck and, and, and take care and stay safe in the time ahead. Gormay Agus Slan. All the best. Thank you. Okay. Members, uh, thank you. So... Um, there is a fair bit of information there, I think, that, that, that the, uh, the officials have agreed to send. Um, but would members be content that the clerk drafts a response to the committee for finance for inclusion in its report on the budget? Um, are members content that, that the clerk go ahead and draft that report? Yeah, I think members are content with that. So that report will be drafted following any response from the department to those issues that we have raised today. So, so the clerk will await the responses, and then those can be included as part of the as part of the uh, report. So, members, I'll take a very short break there, just a comfort break, maybe for ten minutes. Could we come back at eleven ten, and we'll resume our meeting at eleven ten? And could I ask you, clerk, to take us out of broadcasting temporarily? That's our software now. Thank you, Clerk. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. So we will now resume our meeting this morning and we're moving on to a briefing that we're having uh, from the Health and Social Care Board in relation to the Health and Social Care Bill that's currently before the committee. So we're receiving today a briefing from the Chair and the Chief Executive Officer of the Health and Social Care Board on this bill. I refer members to your papers at tab six of the pack. And I would now like to welcome to our meeting Mr. Leslie Drew. And Leslie is Chairperson of the Health and Social Care Board. Are you able to hear us there, Leslie? Yes, Chair, I can hear you. Thank you, Leslie, and we're we are hearing you also. Uh, and we have Ms. Sharon Gallagher, and Sharon is the Chief Executive of the Health and Social Care Board. Are you able to hear us okay, Sharon? Yeah. Morning, Chair, I am indeed. Okay, well, thank you both, and um, I'm... Uh, Glad to see both using headsets and hopefully that will help with the sound. If I can remind all members of our panel and members of committee to uh, remain on mute when you're not speaking, please, as that hopefully will help with the quality of the sound. So I'll go back to you then, uh, uh, Leslie, uh, just in order, of, in order of what I have on my list here. Can you outline how you're going to brief us this morning and then we can move into questions and answers from members? Yes, uh, Chair, I have a, a short uh, introduction, just uh, an overview, and uh, then I'll hand over to the Chief Exec for maybe some short comments and then to yourselves for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Leslie. Okay, good morning, Chair and members of the Health Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today. As you've already said, I'm accompanied today by uh, my Chief Executive, Mrs. Sharon Gallagher. My name is Les Drew. I was appointed as chairperson of the Health and Social Care Board approximately 13 months ago uh, in, on the 1st of April 2020. When I was appointed into this role, I was expecting to be focusing on the closure of the Health and Social Care Board and its migration uh, of its team into a new operating model in line with the recommendations of a number of expert, expert panel review reports. Like most people, I did not fully appreciate the impact that COVID-19 was going to have on all of our lives as well as uh, uh, the health and social care system. Uh, 2020 was to become the most challenging year for the health and social care board in its entire corporate life. I'm immensely proud of how the health and social care board team responded to the challenges of COVID-19, helping to deliver the minister's priorities by working with their colleagues in the Department of Health, the public health agency, hospital trust and primary care sector. I have witnessed firsthand the incredible creativity and innovation of the Health and Social Care Board team as they have not only responded to COVID-19 challenges but have demonstrated a renewed sense of purpose and determination as they have embraced the need for further reform of the current health and social care system. 
Uh, for your information, during the past 12 months, as I've already said, I, I have been personally involved in the appointment of a new chief exec and five out of six members of the senior management team of the Health and Social Care Board. And I believe that these individuals are all totally committed to the new dire direction of travel that has been proposed for the Health and Social Care Board. The objective of the bill is to give uh, effect to the decision to close the Health and Social Care Board, which was initially proposed by Simon Hamilton in November 2015 and endorsed by three separate health ministers. The Health and Social Care Board was established through primary legislation, namely the Health and Social Care Reform Act in 2009. Therefore, new primary legislation is required to affect the closure of the Health and Social Care Board and transfer of responsibilities for management of its functions to the Department of Health. The bill relates solely to the Regional Health and Social Care Board and has no material impact on other health and social care bodies. The purpose of the bill is to dissolve the Health and Social Care Board and transfer responsibility of its functions to the Department of Health. These functions include commissioning of services, performance management of trusts and other providers, and funding allocation. The bill only contains seven clauses and three schedules. Uh, I'm confident that the bill contains sufficient safeguards to ensure that the assets and most importantly, the staff of the Health and Social Care Board are transferred seamlessly and successfully into the Department of Health. Uh, the Health and, Social, Health and Social Care Board may be closing as a corporate entity, but the Health and Social Care Board team will continue to play an extremely vital role in the planning and the design of a new fit for purpose health and social care system for the citizens of Northern Ireland. The bill also contains some necessary amendments uh, 69 to 69 acts or orders dating between 1965 and 2020. And this is mainly just to remove the references to the old Regional Health and Care Board name. I can also con confirm for your information that the Health and Social Care Board existing board of non-executive directors fully support the direction of travel and are keeping a careful watch on progress of this important piece of work. During the past year, uh, the Health and Social Care Board, Board of Non-Executive Directors and myself have continued to perform an important scrutiny role around business as usual activities. I can assure you that as part of our responsibilities for the Health and Social Care Board, we are committed to ensuring that this program of work will successfully meet its conclusion and to this end, my chief exec is a member of the Department of Health Oversight Board, which has been established to oversee this process. In addition to this, a progress report is provided by the project director, Martini Moore, as a standing item at our monthly board meetings. This has provided the Health and Social Care Board non-executive directors with the opportunity to scrutinize and ask challenging questions about this complex project. I can assure you that until this responsibility passes to the department, that the current non-executive directors of the Health and Social Care Board will be fully engaged in the migration process, providing scrutiny and challenge and clear guidance, support and advice when necessary. These uh, functions will transfer to the Department of Health, as I've already said, and they will be subject to the Department of Health's own internal scrutiny and governance arrangements. I have led many change initiatives during um, in a past life in my career with Northern Ireland Electricity Networks. Based on this experience, I can advise the committee that the programme of work to migrate the Health and Social Care Board into the department would appear to be taken forward after having considered all of the obligations of the Health and Social Care Board and also associated risks. The Health and Social Care Board staff and their trade union colleagues are, are, integral, are integral to designing how the new arrangements will work. Uh, they are key players in the process and are able to bring to the table a wealth of knowledge and expertise about the current systems and all of the arrangements. The passing of the bill will, however, bring to an end the current local commissioning group structure. This is an area that I am particularly interested in. Indeed, I regularly attend the local commissioning group chairs forum, and therefore I've seen firsthand evidence of the commendable work that they have been doing. I'm also conscious, however, that the, of the limitations that the current system arrangements have placed on their ability to make a real difference. 
I believe the bill provides us with a real opportunity to change how we plan services. I'm particularly pleased that the local commissioning group members are engaged in the uh, transition process and are indeed represented on the project board. They have committed to playing a vital role in the design of the new way of working and supporting its implementation. They have a valuable insight of both what has worked well currently and also what uh, uh, has not worked well and needs to be addressed. The LGC have historically provided a local voice and that voice must be clearly heard from within whatever new model is put in place. It's clear that the need for change has never been greater. We heard the minister last week refer to the current dire situation regarding waiting lists. These are not just numbers, but individuals who could so easily be a member of our family, a work colleague or a neighbor. We must all play our part in arriving at a solution, and part of this must be to look at how we plan our services. To remove duplication and empower our local communities to plan and deliver services that they need for their population. I'm pleased that this work to develop a new planning model is now uh, going forward jointly between the Health and Social Care Board team and the Department of Health colleagues. This partnership approach recognizes the need for joint up thinking and as we try to design a new approach. In conclusion, Chair, the closure of the Health and Social Care Board and its migration, or the migration of its team into a new operating model was first announced almost six years ago. This has been a long process, particularly for the staff involved, and I think that the passing of the bill would be a significant milestone in enabling a much larger transformation journey to be taken forward. Finally, I believe that during my short tenure that I have been able to build a strong and robust relationship with the new chief exec and senior management team. I have tried to engage with the health and social care team, health and social care board team at every level regarding closure through staff engagement. I'm confident that we all share a common vision for the future where the citizens of Northern Ireland will enjoy better health outcomes. Chair, I was just going to hand over to my chief executive uh, to make a few comments if that's appropriate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Leslie. And go ahead, Sharon. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to get confused today, so if, I'm working to two chairs at the minute, the chair of the board and the chair of the committee, but <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep it brief. <laughs> so, um, as you know, I've been uh, working on the transformation agenda and specifically this area of work since 2015, when the decision to close the board was initially made, Chair, um, and that decision was um, reaffirmed by subsequent ministers uh, since that point. Um, in September, I was appointed to Chief Executive of the Board alongside my Deputy Secretary role in the Department. So it's a unique position in that I'm leading the work to close the Board on, the, on behalf of the Department, but also discharging the Chief Executive responsibilities of running the business of the Board and managing the transition of the staff and the functions into the Department. I suppose really what we're trying to do in essence is shadow run or, or a shadow form what the new model will look like to test it. Um, we have an opportunity, I think, in taking forward the le legislation uh, to build a new way of working. I mean, what, what, what we know is that there's complexities in the system and there's a level of bureaucracy in the system. And that's what we're trying to work against in the future. We're trying to make sure that the resources are concentrated to where they will have most effect. Um, I guess, as Les said, it's fair to say that the uncertainty over recent years has had a detrimental impact on the confidence and the morale of the workforce in the board. And since my appointment last September, it's something that I have given a lot of focus to. I wanted to provide some clarity to staff and ensure that they are consulted, uh, not just on the future model, but the role that they will play in it. Um, the decision to close the board, as you know, was taken in the context that the current broader commissioning process isn't fit for purpose. Um, and importantly, as Les has said, uh, work is well advanced in developing a new model for commissioning health and social care services moving forward. That blueprint is in the final stages of development and will be considered soon by our health minister. And finally, uh, just in line with um, what Les has said, um, I look forward to bringing through this legislation. I think it will mark an end to the, um, I suppose, the, um, the, the, the lack of certainty about moving forward. It will allow us to bring forward our transformation journey 
but more importantly, it will allay the concerns of staff and really provide them certainty for their future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair and uh, Chief Executive, both for, for those briefings. And I suppose, um, and I am, I am struck, uh, Leslie, that you, see, you referenced the fact that you, in your view, there were sufficient safeguards in place for assets and staff. And that is that is to be welcomed, and and I, I do get a sense that there has been a fair degree of effort put into that, and I think I think I certainly and probably the committee more broadly would welcome that staff are being prioritised in terms of having their this transition managed in a way which reduces any anxiety or and, and is as smooth as possible for them. More generally, in relation to the commissioning, I suppose I was struck as 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 both of you were speaking, I was struck with the the analogy of. Um, that you, you wouldn't ever move house without knowing, first of all, what the new house was like, and also that the new house was ready before you move out of your own house. And I'm just struck with the whole issue around the local commissioning groups. And we've heard several references to the work being well advanced um, in terms of what would replace it. And I'm just wondering, um, Leslie, are you, are you satisfied personally in your role as chair that there is sufficient safeguards around the uh, protection of local involvement in the new commissioning model, and and even indeed indeed how that can be enhanced, let alone stand still. So, are you are you satisfied that, that enough work has been done in relation to that in terms of preparation, and that that a committee and everyone else can satisfy themselves that that the the uh, the system in play, that is designed to be picked up will be available for us. To have a look and scrutinise before before this is all complete. Chair, uh, as I said, uh, I would regularly attend the local commissioning chairs forum, and uh, I've been impressed by the level of engagement uh, from them in this process. Uh, clearly, uh, the process is you know there's still work ongoing, and the entire commissioning model you know may not be ready for the first of April. But certainly the framework, the structure is being thought through. I think careful consideration is being given to where things have not worked and where they can be improved. Uh, we currently have local commissioning groups who do not have any relationship with trust, uh, really, uh, you know, a close integrated relationship. Uh, but uh, we have a, a integrated care partnerships who have a close relationship and, and, and they will also be involved in making uh, decisions regarding the design of the future model. Uh, so I, I'm confident, I'm very confident that everyone, all of the stakeholders involved are being uh, consulted, uh, their views are being taken on board, and I think that that will lead to a much better population-based, local population-based commissioning model in the future than, than what we currently have now. The local commissioning groups have done a tremendous job in terms of their expertise and their knowledge and I think it's it's excellent that that knowledge uh, I'm certainly encouraged that it's being captured and it's being brought into the process of developing the new model and in your experience um, how should the new model differ from the current model where the added value I think uh, you know. I think that it has to be uh, based on an integrated care system approach, where it's it's the local population, uh, you know, representatives who are involved in community planning, who are involved in integrated care partnerships, who are, who are at trust level, who are close to their own populations, will be able to identify the needs, the health and, and well-being needs of those populations, and to design service delivery that is appropriate to meet those needs. So it's bringing the health and care system closer to the, the actual population so it's not an, and there's not the same inequality or postcode lottery. Giving a voice to local community in terms of health yeah. and social care needs. And, and can you tell us any more about how that will be done in practice? What will replace the local commissioning groups? Well, that, that, that's being worked at the moment, and if, I'm sure if the Chief Executive would, would like to, to come in and add to that, but uh, the, the, the local commissioning group chairs are, and members are being involved in the process, and what that will look like in a number of months' time, the, you know, the, the, that, that will unfold, and the Chief Executive might be able to give just a wee bit more detail on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Sharon. Thanks. 
Thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose I would say a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, the closure of the board, uh, and you'll have heard this before, Chair, is just phase one. Um, in order to change the way we commission services, it's a massive undertaking. It's a very complex system. There are many players involved and there's a lot of money involved. Um, and the, the, the one thing that we want to protect is services. So, uh, you know, reorganizing ourselves can't come at the cost of a uh, service delivery either in resource as in people resource or in financial resource so the closure of the board is step one as of the first of april 2022 we will have new networks formed at local level and that's the work martina and the team are working through at the minute what that looks like and as les has said the local commissioning groups and icps and others are involved in determining what that looks like but you'd asked about the biggest change um, in terms of the end model the aspirational model, the one that we're, we're going for in terms of a blueprint. And I suppose on paper, it doesn't look that different because on paper, we have an integrated uh, health and uh, social care model at the minute, you know, so uh, ICPs, LCGs, they all do a really good job. But the feedback that we're getting and what we know is that they don't have enough, they're not empowered sufficiently well. So the new model needs to look at how we empower the networks at local level more and that means you know accountability that means funding that means allowing them to determine what's needed at local level we have a process at the minute that nearly says that on paper but works against itself and the learning that Les has talked about it again and again is listening to the voices of those people that have been involved to say, well, here's what's working well, because not everything's wrong. Here's what work is what's working well, and here's the areas that we really, really need to focus on to make it better. Yeah, and given given that that's all known, and, and I, I I appreciate your answers on that, Sharon. But also given your kind of and you you yourself said as a sort of a unique role in that you're a chief executive of the board, but also responsible within the department. Um, so I just go back to my house analogy. You wouldn't move out of your old house until you had seen the new house and knew it was fit for purpose. Doing this in two stages, or at least two stages or phases is a choice that the department has made. So they are putting in front of us uh, a proposal to close the board without showing us a look at what the new arrangements are going to be like. Can you see where that's like, you know, why why would that be a, a sensible? Why not, would it not make more sense that you would simultaneously present, here's what we're proposing to replace it by? I think that's a fair point, Chair, and I think what I would say is we are doing it simultaneously, but the implementation is going to be staged. So in a very short period, you will get a briefing from uh, the team about what that looks like, and I'm more than happy to come back at that time. Uh, and as I say, on paper, it won't look that different. This is about a, a change in terms of accountability, in terms of a cultural piece, in terms of a real investment at local level. Um, and a about a, a more delegated authority with trusts working with uh, primary care, with community care. When we consulted in 2015-16, what we heard back at that point was we agree the, the board needs to close because it creates a layer of bureaucracy. But actually, we're not quite sure. We don't. We're not quite sure how this integration will work in practice. You know, trusts are a big entity. Will other players get lost in that? Will all of the finance go to the trust? And that's the things that take more time. They need time to engage with people to build the trust and to move us into a different uh, set of circumstances. Because, you know, my view is when I took this work on in 2015 and looked at the legislation, and I've said this before, my first thoughts were, well, what's wrong with that? And any model can work on paper, but it's about how people come to the table, the maturity of the relationships, the trust within the relationships. And I think we need to spend some time and effort in developing that. Okay, and, and I suppose I, I, I do welcome the fact that we are uh, shortly, as you I think you said, put it, uh, going to get that briefing on what's going to replace and what's, what the proposed new model is. Can you commit that, that will, we will receive that in advance of us completing our consideration of this bill? I would very much hope so, uh, Chair. Um, yes, uh, I think is the short answer. It hasn't been to the Minister, but we're more than uh, happy to come back uh, and talk about that uh, pending the Minister's consideration. 
Okay, I think I think committee will be keen to have that. So thank you for that, Sharon. And I will uh, go then to members. So I'm going first of all to Deputy Chair Pam Cameron, then Carol Nichillen, then Aurelia Flynn. Those are the members that I have indicated at present. So Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to Leslie and Sharon for your um, for your attendance and for your evidence here at committee today on this important subject. Um, I wanted to ask you if there are aspects of the current complaints or appeals processes that um, for service providers that could be addressed or improved under the bill. That's my first question. And I wanted to ask you also if, um, if there are lessons from accountability models elsewhere that you believe are, are relevant when considering the provisions of this bill. Pam, I'm happy to take those questions, Les, if you're content. Yes, Sharon, go ahead. I suppose uh, in terms of their first one, the appeals in, ser in terms of service providers, Pam, was that? So um, at the minute, the structure uh, is the minister sets the priorities through a commissioning plan direct direction and the board and the PHA alongside partners then create a commissioning plan and the trust then uh, commit to that plan through their uh, uh, trust plans. In terms of appeals on uh, commissioning decisions, I suppose given that the minister sets the priorities, the board and the PHA work in consultation with stakeholders about how those uh, services can be commissioned. Um, and that is certainly an ongoing engagement and, and consulting, consultation approach. So there is an agreed an agenda there. Um, there hasn't been the case, I don't believe, where um, there has been a, a need for an appeal process in that. Um, and, you know, if you could maybe give me an example, I could maybe tease that out a little bit more for you because I'm not sure I've answered your question there. No, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. OK, um, thanks. Pam. And, then, and, then and in terms of learning from uh, other uh, accountable care systems or integrated care systems, I suppose we have done a lot of research and conversations and, and considerations of what, what others are doing. There is no doubt that an integrated approach is the only way forward. We can't have silos. I suppose some of the learning is what I've just referred to with the chair. It's about relationships, not about what it says on a piece of paper. It's about trust. It's about supporting an integrated uh, care structure with accountability, governance and funding and importantly it's about being clear about outcomes and understanding what the needs of a local population are. So very clearly those people that work within a community that understand that community know what's best in relation to responding from a health and social care perspective uh, to their needs. Thanks for that. Um Sharon and obviously the the, um, the chair of the committee has um, already touched upon um, the the local commission groups and I suppose there is concern about around risk of losing um, that expertise that expertise that that is there um, with the abolition of those local commission groups. Um, so I'm just wondering um, how do we ensure that commissioning of services doesn't create a monopoly for hospital services as an example. So the local commissioning groups is a naming convention that sits with the current legislation and that's why LCGs you know will uh, will close or it, because the legislation is being changed the work that we are doing is trying to actually enhance the local voice and enhance the local decision making. So the construct that we do it through might be called something different than an LCG or an ICP, but it won't be that far away, Pam. And it'll, you know, in the main be the, you know, some of the same people will be involved. You know, they're already taking part in terms of determining what that looks like. But at the heart of what we're doing is putting an emphasis on local commissioning more broadly, local uh, understanding of need, local planning of services and local delivery. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Pam. you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. And can I just ask all members to go on to mute if you're not speaking? We're, we're picking up some background noise there. So I'll go now to Carol Nicholin. Uh, go away, Carol. Um, thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So um thank thank you, Sharon and Leslie, for the presentation. Um some of the some of the questions I have um are re in relation to so you've said the, in response to Pam's question that some of the you know uh, descriptions may change, but essentially it's the same function. So for example, the local commissioning groups and the integrated care partnerships. But I, I, I just want to go back to Colm's point. I think we need more definition at this stage because while we all supported the position in terms of health and social care board, I still think there's a lot of clarity it's needed. So for example, in relation to trade unions and staff side representatives, what role do they have in this process at the minute? Well, I pick up on the first one, Sharon. Just I think I said in my introduction that uh, obviously the uh, staff and trade union representatives from from all of the various unions have been involved in the process, and uh, yeah, that gives me some confidence in terms of the you know the the, the safeguards around the bill that, that they have been involved uh, and are represented on the project board. Sharon, would you like to add that? Thanks, Les. Um, Carl, I suppose. Um, I've mentioned that I've been involved in this work since 2015. In 2018, I set up the staff side forum with trade unions, uh, and that includes NIPSA, Unite, or CNBMA, and, and, and Unison. Uh, and that forum meets every uh, two months, still runs, uh, and it, it meets every two months. Um, I think you had a previous briefing in terms of the structure of the programme board and the projects, and trade union uh, representatives are embedded in that process as well. So we have put a very strong emphasis on engagement with staff representatives. But I would also say that uh, since taking up post as chief executive, I have spent a lot of time and energy engaging with the staff and the board itself about the closure. Um, I have met with every single member of staff since I started in uh, Zoom sessions uh, to discuss, you know, uh, what they do now and try and get an understanding of their future. Um, I've also developed a new broader people strategy. It was just launched this week called Ambition. And what that does is seeks to build the capacity and capability and try to build the morale again in the uh, from the staff in the board with a real focus on the future rather than the past. So the decision has been made to close the board. We're moving forward on that. And the whole focus for me is supporting staff into that future. So I'm very committed to engaging with the people because, you know, I keep saying you can put any structure on paper, but if you don't bring the people with you, then, you know, you're wasting your time. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's an absolute priority for me and the team and the board within the Health and Social Care Board. So I appreciate that, Sharon. Um, and Leslie, you said in relation, you're right, I mean, it is a small enough bill. Um, and in terms of some of the, particularly the question I have is in relation to clause four of the bill, when we're looking at transitional arrangements and provisions, which are necessary to, make, to mitigate any potential risks arising from the closure of the Health and Social Care Board. So primarily I'm thinking of, um, so what do you feel are the current risks? And for example, you know, some of these functions will go straight to the department and then to the trust. So for, you know, particular health scandals around hyponatremia neurology and with another public inquiry coming into urology, um, what other risks do you anticipate that you need to mitigate against as part of the, this bill being brought forward? Thank you. Uh, you're just 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 come off mute, please, Les. Sorry, Thank you. sorry, sure. sorry. Uh, all of the functions will uh, the responsibility for management coordination of them will, will pass to the Department of Health. Uh, if that you know to reassure you on that, so the Department of Health will be responsible for all of the risk management around that, and will be part of their internal governance and control to ensure that that is properly managed. Uh, in terms of other risks, that 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 you know they're. Obviously, uh, 
in the current COVID-19 uh, world that we're, we're, we're all experiencing, that in itself could be a huge distraction from day-to-day -day business as usual services. But I believe that each of the trusts have their own uh, board who also have a role in terms of governance and accountability, and they will be carefully watching the delivery of services from within the individual hospital trusts and also uh, by the other service providers. So, you know, I, I believe that there there is sufficient governance and accountability built into the current system and what is being planned. And that gives me certain confidence, a certain a, a high level of confidence in terms of being able to respond to any risks that may occur. And Chair, I'm assuming then, so who, who's the Chair of the Oversight Project Board at the minute? Uh, the Chair of the Oversight Project Board, it would be, it's, it's Martina Moore, isn't it, Sharon? Sorry, the Oversight Board, uh, Carl, be, is the Permanent, be permanent, sec sec permanent Secretary. Secretary. The, um, and the, okay. the project director is Martina Moore, but Oversight, the tool chair, is Permanent Secretary. But there's no staff type representatives on that board, are there? No, that's the chief executives, uh, primarily of the organisations affected. Carol, if I might just add um, a couple of points in relation to the risks. So you're right, um, the bill sets out for risks, um, and that's primarily associated with the transfer of the staff, the assets and the liabilities. In terms of the risks more broadly, and, and there are many, as you know, in health and social care, and, and you've named just some of them, I suppose what I would say in terms of my experience over the last number of months when I have held both roles is that it has already reduced bureaucracy and handoffs and because I sit in the top management group because I sit on the rebuild management board and because I work within the the departmental structure to the minister there's a much closer interface between what the work of the board between what the board does uh, how quickly uh, they they uh, are engaged and how quickly they respond to that so there's not the handoffs that there would have been previously and you will know that many of what of our learning in terms of some of these things has been there's been too many organizations involved in that so i'm already starting to see and i'm hope the broader system is starting to see how that uh, uh, the effect of bringing the board into more direct responsibility of the department is really making a change uh, in terms of the way we do business uh, could I just add to that? I think uh, you know what Sharon has said is very true. I think there's now a greater line of sight uh, between the department and uh, will will be between the department and the trusts at the moment with the health and social care board in the as it were in the middle. It it is create it creates a certain level of bureaucracy that obviously if that is removed, then uh, you know the department can deal directly with trusts, which will speed up uh, uh, you know any processes that 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 are involved in investigations, etc. Okay, thank you. Carol, yeah. Is that you, Carol? Is that you complete? Yeah, thank you, Carol. Okay, and I'm going then to our Leah Flynn. Go ahead, our Leah, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Sharon and Leslie. Um, I suppose my second question was um, answered there in, in response to, to Carl. So it was really just trying to define when we're talking about this whole process and this new structure, um, you know, streamlining um the that process, the commissioning of services. Um, I think both of you have touched on it there. You know, with, with you know, um, just trying to cut out some of the bureaucracy and, as you were saying there, Leslie, about the you know the department and the trusts having that sort of you know closer connection and you know things being you know done a bit quicker and whatever, which which sounds um which all sounds really positive, but. Maybe if I could just bring it back to um Pam had touched on it in her question um earlier, just around the, the appeals process. So we had a bit of a discussion around this um a couple of weeks back when we had a briefing from um the the um department and the builds team and the issue around the appeals process had come up. So as we know it's contained within the bill that there is that mechanism for um an appeals process for the primary medical providers in relation to their contracts and stuff and I had asked the question if um, there could be scope within the bill then to look at uh, an appeals process in terms of the commissioning of services um, and, and how that you know could, could be you know challenged or questioned 
um, if necessary. Now, the response the other week was that um, they weren't actually sure if there was an appeals process around commissioning that was already in place um, in the board. So it was a bit difficult to sort of continue on the conversation around how it would look at that structure or set up in, you know, in the in the Revay structure that we'll be working from. So can you just confirm, is there a mechanism in place at, at the moment for that process? Uh, I think he, I'll take... Sorry, go ahead, Sharon. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Sharon. Uh, uh, I think early he um I suppose there 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 is no appeals process is suppose the short answer. Um in terms of the commissioning process, um I, and I would need to understand better, you know, what what you mean by appeals because when the minister sets the priorities and uh, issues those through the commissioning plan direction, then there is a process in place that takes all of the uh, stakeholders uh, involved in order to develop the response to that. So that's basically the commissioning plan. And in that commissioning plan, then there's sign offs by the boards. Uh, so the board of the PHA and the board of uh, the health and social care board are all involved in that. Um, that makes sure that it is in line with the ministerial priorities and it is in keeping with uh, our commissioning processes, but also with Within the budget that has been allocated. So there is nothing in that commissioning plan that can't be aligned back up to the minister's priorities or be affordable within that. Okay, um, no, that, that's uh, that's fair enough. And I know you, because you mentioned that earlier, Sharon, that, you know, that there, that there might be that need for an appeals process in terms of commissioning and the point that you made there around, you know, um, I suppose the, the approach it's taken at the minute where so, you know, for talk's sake, if certain stakeholders had an issue and this has come up in, in the past, I've certainly dealt with different groups um, on different issues when a, a commission and decision has been made. And, you know, not everyone has been content or happy with with that approach. Um, so I suppose I think it's a, I think it's a fair point, because in actual fact, there are many occasions when there is a lot of people not content and it's not maybe about the commissioning because the service is commissioning commissioned it's the about the amount of, of funding that we can apply to that commissioning uh, and that's that's a challenging one because you I mean i know you've had the briefing from colleagues in the department just before now there's simply not enough money to go around so there's that you know conflict always between the the, the commissioning of the service itself and how much you can fund uh, to bring forward, you know, the services in, in a meaningful way that meets demand. And I think, you know, we would all say that in most uh, areas, there's just not enough money to meet demand at the minute. Yep. And, and maybe just to, to pick up on that as well, um, Sharon, the, you know, so in terms of the stakeholders that are involved in um, the, the commission and plans and decisions that are made, so how, how will that change from the, the arrangements that's in place now and you know where the stakeholders come in in this current structure how will that change in in the new structure so then that will hopefully determine you know the need for yes. a process or not if everyone's content that they're having their their sort of input and and their voice heard um is there a big difference from you know um the the structure at the moment and the new one in terms of the stakeholders and their input <laughs> So I suppose the new model, um, and, and we talked about this earlier, is actually um, aimed at giving more accountability and the financial resources at local level so that they can have the conversation, you know, the local groups can have the conversation, they can understand the local need, they can decide on the services that needed and they can make the investment on those services and hold to account. Uh, so it's the same collaborative effect. Um, there may still not be enough money, so there might still be a little bit of conflict. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting for one second that we move into this new arena and everybody's going to be content uh, because there are still you know, huge challenges facing us all in health and social care. But the key point is that the groups will have the wherewithal that sometimes isn't missing now because of our, our structure and our accountabilities in this. Okay, and then maybe just finally, Sharon, thanks for that. Um, so you yes, mentioned that um, the the chair of the oversight board then is the, the permanent secretary. So um, you know, in terms of the the 
the Minister for Health. Um, you know, what what input or role does he play on that board? Um, you know, is it then just the responsibility of the permanent secretary to, you know, communicate with the minister, or does can he play an active role in this new structure? So the role of the oversight board is to basically oversee the closure of the Health and Social Care Board. Um, so it would act in a normal way with the Permanent Secretary, you know, chairing the meetings and then any uh, decisions falling from that will be a ministerial decision. Um, and in the main, up until now, we've dealt with the process of closing the board. So dealing with the bill, understanding the implications and responding to that. But ultimately, all decisions are made by the minister. OK, that's good, Sharon. Yeah. OK, just Orla, uh, just a couple of points for myself. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and thanks, Sharon, for your responses. But uh, for me, I think uh, the words delegation and empowerment have come up a number of times. And for me, that's extremely important that there, whatever model has been in place, that there is there is clear delegation and empowerment and, get, and local populations are given responsibility for uh, for finance and, and resources in terms of providing the health and social care needs of that that, that local population. That's great, Leslie. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Orla. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am I am not seeing any other indications at the minute there, but if members want to come in for a very quick last point or indicate that that's fine, I'll just touch back on them before we go. I suppose um, I suppose just in, on reflecting on, on this session and, and on the previous uh, sessions we've we've heard. Uh, there are a lot of the right things being said, you know, and, and I think the, the the committee fully support. The direction of travel that you're you're setting out there. The problem here is there's a lack of detail and a lack of a lack of a lack of clarity. And while we absolutely, I think, want to see the removal of unnecessary bureaucracy and the system working as well as possible, we don't want to lose involvement. We don't want to lose local local input and in, in, inclusion in the system. We don't want to lose accountability, and we don't want to lose, lose that improvement. So. I think there is, there is, it is, it is to me a, a, a unfortunate that it has been done in a staged, in a stage way, and I welcome that commitment that you've given us there, Sharon. I think that's important that we do see, um, given that the work is so well advanced, that we do see the the actual detail because I mean that's where that's where we can look at the granular, the granular detail of it, and and reassure ourselves and, and everyone that the uh, the replacement system is there and is robust and is ready to go and does not only meet the needs but improves that local involvement that co-production and uh, the accountability process that we're all I, I i i do think we're all on the same page in terms of that's where we're trying to get to but in in relation to the timing we need to see that coming forward so i don't see any other indication from members there les or or Sharon, uh, I want to thank you for your attendance here today. I think that's been useful, and and I'm sure that uh, we will we will be you know continuing our scrutiny of this of this process and our consideration. But I want to thank you for your contribution to that. So thank you and good thank goodbye. You. We will hopefully see you Thanks again. Thanks very much. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, members. So. Um, yeah, I think I think I think there is a kind of a uh, that concern there that that there's not enough clarity. Yeah, someone looking in there, is there? I'm hearing some background noise. So okay, okay, I'll go. I'll go ahead. Okay, I'm hearing quite a bit of background noise here at this point in time. Okay, members, if there's nothing further, then uh, we obviously will be continuing our, our scrutiny of this of this uh, of this bill, and I think it's important that we do um, we do see what is replacing the or what's proposed to replace it, and how that will improve the situation going forward. So, thank you, members. I'm going to move on to the next item on our agenda. Can I ask all members to ensure that you're on mute before we move on? Um, can I just check, Clerk? Uh, have we got the, have the officials left the line from that last session? Yeah, yes, Chair, they, they've left. There seems to be a wee bit of feedback from somewhere, but I'm not too sure where it's from. Yeah. Okay, and it's, it's still there, but it's reduced a little. Um, so, on, Alan, can I just check if you can go on mute there? There's, you're the only name that I can see that's not got a mute button beside you. And Jerry, also. Jerry Carroll, can you check that you're on mute? 
okay, I think that has improved the situation there. Um, I think that has improved there with with that. Okay, members, so I'm going to move on then to the next item on our agenda, which are two uh, SRs. Next two items are SRs relating to coronavirus restrictions. Can I remind members that we received a briefing on these SRs at last week's meeting, but agreed that we would defer our consideration pending the report of the examiner of statutory rules coming to us. And just to let members know, both of these SRs are subject to confirmatory resolution. So the first one then is SR 2021 forward slash 93. And I refer members there to tab seven of your pack. This SR is a consolidation of the, of the coronavirus res restrictions legislation. The examiner of statutory rules has asked the department to make amendments to this SR to provide clarifications around the closure of listed business or relevant retail businesses. In addition, the examiner has requested that the department provides a link to the guidance on funerals in the regulations to improve accessibility. The department has confirmed that it will make those amendments at the earliest opportunity. So have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? Chair, Paula? Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. I'm not sure, are there any officials on the line or no? We don't have officials on the line because we received the briefing on this last week. Okay. Uh, is that correct, Clerk? Sorry, Chair, I'm just, I'm just checking that, if you give me a wee second. Yep, okay. Chair, just, just while um, the clerk is looking at that, it's really just around the enforcement notices and the premise improvement notices that seem to have been allocated to some of the businesses in Belfast City Centre. And there's been some quite high profile commentary around, for example, the Morn Seafood Bar and um, the Sunflower Bar. And I was with um, AMPM, who also spoken out publicly in the press around some restrictions being placed on their ability to operate from, from tomorrow. So it's really just uh, if there was departmental officials there for us as, as elected reps, especially those of us who represent urban areas that are going to be most affected by this, whether we can get a bit of clarity as to what actually has happened in the last week or so compared to what happened last summer, whenever they, they were operating under the same um, conditions. So I'm not sure whether we can get clarity today. Okay, I'll just check back with the clerk. Clerk, have you any uh, anything to uh, add to this? So, sorry, Chair, we're just confirming there is um, an official on. Their down is withheld, but we're just trying to confirm who that is at the minute. Okay, well, well maybe I propose that we we'll move on to the other, the next SR, and we have then a further, a third SR in terms of mental health, and we'll come back to this one and see can we get an official on the line to address that, given that these that these situations have arisen since last week, I think is, is what you're saying, Paula, or, or have become, have, have emerged. So I'll go on to the, I'll go on to the next SR, um, and, and we'll, we'll let the, the clerk uh, see if he can pick up, get an official onto the line. So I'll move on then to item eight, which is SR 2021 forward slash 97. Uh, and I refer members to papers on this SR at tab eight of your pack. These SRs provide for some easements of the restrictions, permits click and collect services, removes restrictions on movements, allows 10 people to meet outdoors at a private dwelling, and allows for the reopening of certain business. Um, and having read that over, I think that is likely to overlap maybe slightly with, with the question. So in that case, what I think I should do then is move on again and come back to both of those. We have a third SR in relation to the mental health order, which I think we'll move to now, and then we'll, we'll come back to consideration of both of those SRs following that. So moving on to item nine, which is SR 2021 forward slash 101. Uh, the Mental Health 1986 Order, Amendment Number 2, Order NA 2021. I refer members to the papers of tab 9 of your pack and in particular to the clerk's memo at tab 9.1. Members will recall that the department met an SR earlier this year, which extended the period of time which must elapse for a second opinion to be required for the continued administration of medicine to patients detained under the Mental Health Order from three months to six months. The SR before the committee today changes 
the period required for a second opinion back to three months. So this is an issue that the committee has pushed the department on, and I do think we should we, we welcome that the regulation and the move to go back to the three month limit. The department advises in the explanatory memorandum accompanying the rule that it has consulted with the health and social care trusts, the health and social care board, PHA, professional bodies, and others on the change, and that there was broad support for the change. This SR is subject to negative resolution. Uh, the examiner of statute rules has no issues to raise in relation to this SR. So any uh, any members' uh, comments in relation to that? Or Leah? Yeah. Go ahead, or Leah. Sorry. Um, yeah, sure. It's obviously just a welcome um, that, uh, that that provision is back now to the three-month period, so patients don't need to wait to the six months. And as you said, I think the committee did do good work on this. Um, and, you know, um, just tracking the department's progress and movements on how many times it was required that people did have to wait the six months. But, um, the uh, um, yeah, it was just to make the point, if you remember, it was last week or the week before um, when we were discussing this and we had agreed that we would write to the minister just around the concerns that there is, um, you know, there's that extremely small limited number of staff that can, you know, that can give the second opinions and the department in their latest update to us, it says that the minister was working with or speaking with RQIA to try and look at, um, you know, enhancing that provision. So it's just to make that point again that we'll have that letter in and hopefully that'll be, there'll be a bit more progress on this issue in the time ahead, but just glad to see that, um, that this, that it's back to the three month period for people getting their second opinion. Thank you, Arlea. And Jerry, were you looking in there? No, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I don't see any other members indicating their presence, so I'm going to move to our formal consideration of this statutory rule. So can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 10, the Mental Health 1986 order, amendment number two order, NI 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank you, members. And I'm just going to check back with the clerk if we have an official on the line. If not, we will move on to other items of business and return to this uh, to provide additional time. But I just want to check with the clerk if he's made any progress in relation to officials. Yes, sir. We, we did ask officials to be on standby. I do see that we have a withheld number on. Um, but I'm not sure. I know Liz um, and Marianne had been due to be on standby. So um, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but we are here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. We are we are we are we are hearing you there, Liz. So oh, listen, great. Liz. Uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I know we did have a briefing on this last week, but uh, members have raised, and Paula Bradshaw particularly, raised a point that has arose since last week in relation to some difficulties businesses are experiencing. So um, I I don't see you there, but I am hearing you, and I'll go across to Paula and ask Paula to, to go ahead with her question. Um, thank you, Chair, and thanks um, to the official. I didn't see, see the name there, but um, it's really just in terms of the public discussion at the minute regarding the um, social media posts from the likes of Sunflower Bar and Moore and Seafood, um, for example, who are saying that they have received notices from, I think it must be council officials, enforcement officers, to say that they cannot op um, open tomorrow, even though they ha haven't changed the, the setup from last summer. And I'm just wondering, I, I had a quick look there, but I, I, so it could be in the wrong, but I'm not seeing... Um, any change really in terms of the regulations that have come for us apart from switching on and switching off um so is this an issue with how council are implementing the regulations is it to do with the smoking um outdoor smoking spaces regulations or what exactly is the problem there because there are businesses we have fresh project that produce that's arriving and um, staff and, and tail bookings etc that they will probably have to cancel um today if, if they can't get some sort of resolution and understanding of what went wrong that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we are aware of the, the, the discussion about this. Um, so I think the uh, it, it's come to the fore because of the changes around um, outdoor hospitality sec, uh, settings. But the link to the definition of indoor and outdoor, um, which is to the smoke free regulations 
uh, that came in in 2007. It has always been there, uh, dating back to um, the number two regulations in July 2020. Um, so that has been retained and the um, opening of outdoor hospitality has been linked in the same way as it was last year to the, the definitions within the smoke-free uh, legislation. So I think the, the other dimension of this is around enforcement and the, the way that councils are, are dealing with that, and that is not something I could comment on. Okay, thank you. So, so just to confirm, then you haven't updated the guidance from last summer. It, this is more an interpretation of how councils are actually um, carrying out their enforcement role in relation to outdoor spaces. That's correct. I think the, the definition is clear in the regulations. Okay, and just finally then, is there any movement maybe even today from the executive to intervene and quickly update um, those regulations um, or the guidance in advance of tomorrow? I know it's very, very short time, but obviously the um, businesses are under immense pressure. So is the department looking to maybe intervene? It's my, my question, thank you. Um, well, from our perspective, it's clear in, in the law, so I can't comment on what other discussions might be going on around that. Um, but in terms of the regulations, uh, there's no intention to change the regulations. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, yes, go ahead, Carol. I have so I have just to let members know I have indications from Carol, from Jerry, Carol, and from Pam. So go ahead, Carol. So, um, so thank you. Um, so, in follow, following up from what Paula has asked, um, Liz, what, what I would like to know is that given the fact that there seems to be a disparity across council areas, because what you've said is the guidelines have not changed from last year, the same structures, the same conditions are being used this year as they were last year. So, I would like. Um, for the minister to ask TEO um, what difference there is this year from what there was last year. I don't think it's good enough, in my opinion, um, to say that, you know, there's nothing else we can do because I know that staff have been taken off furlough. I know that um, other staff have been brought in. People have made bookings. Uh, albeit provisionally, and this is a complete mess and what should be particularly a really good news story for Belfast, uh, and I could even talk about my own constituency, is now turned out to be a complete dog's dinner. So, uh, and that's notwithstanding the stress and the financial hardship that it's brought to those businesses that are involved. It's also a big embarrassment for the council and it's a huge embarrassment and a huge disappointment for the, the, the chamber. So if you could, let's bring it back to the minister and, and chair, if we could ask at the end to write urgently to TEO and the minister to see if we can get this rectified before tomorrow, please. Okay, thank you, Carol. Jerry, Carol, Lanaray, right, Jerry. Um, yeah, just following on from that and, and to other questions, um, and it seems to be from, from looking at the, the sunflowers, uh, commentary and speaking to people there that uh, they're being told because they have four walls um, that they, they cannot uh, open. Uh, but even if they had knocked down some of the walls, then they still couldn't open. And that just seems uh, bizarre to me in terms of uh, the current uh, guidelines. And uh, my understanding is obviously you can be at the back of somebody's um, property outdoors uh, safely if they have four walls. Um, so I suppose what's the difference between under regulations, uh, outdoor um, bars or other premises and, and uh, people's uh, homes. Uh, the other two questions is um, I was just looking through again um, the uh, part three on the first SR uh, it says a person may only organise, operate or participate in an indoor gathering of more than one household if it consists of no more than six persons and no more than two households. So I don't I don't think that was discussed last week from my uh, recollection, but can we get some clarity on what those events are, what they're um, able uh, to be? And then finally, I know some members asked it last week, but um, just for, for clarity's purposes, 
Um, in terms of travel, um, the um, stay at home message has obviously been lifted. Um, and there was a 10 mile, I think it was a guidance, it wasn't a legislation in terms of people not traveling. Um, has that been removed or what is the current uh, restriction on people traveling? Because obviously there's been a change to caravans and other uh, operators and people can, can travel those. So what is the, the current uh, restrictions around uh, travel, if any? Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Go ahead, Liz, please. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll come back to this first one last because I, I actually didn't really follow the question, so I'd like some clarity on that. Um, but if I just start um, with the six from two in private gardens, Jerry, is that what you were asking about? Yeah. Uh, six from two, it says indoors in the regulations. Six from two indoors. I can read it to you if it's helpful. Um, a person may only organise, operate or participate in an indoor gathering of more than one household if it consists of no more than six persons and no more than two households. Thanks. Yeah, no, now I'm, now I'm with you. That um, provision applies to general gatherings. It's not within or outside and in, in private dwellings. Um, so uh, I think maybe that's the clarification you were looking for. Um, I'm aware of the, the outdoor um, to household restriction, but it does say indoor in the preceding sentence. But if you're telling me that it's the general regulation for outdoors, then I, uh, I take, your, take your word for it. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the, um, the issue. It's for indoor, indoors, but not in private dwellings. It does say that uh, somewhere in the, in the regulations. So you, you'll be able to find that cross-reference. There, are, there obviously are ex exceptions that are made in the regulations around um, workplaces and education and so forth. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, go on then to Pam Cameron, and I will then go to, Jer uh, to Jonathan. Yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry oh, yeah, there's, sorry. Two other, there's two other questions just to, to answer, sorry. Uh, all right, okay. Yeah, yes, I, I was just going to come to the, the travel one. So um, as we discussed um, last week, the um, restriction on people's movements that required them to stay at home or the place in, in which they live, um, unless they had a reasonable excuse, that was lifted from the 12th of April. Um, so there was no legal barrier to people um, moving about um, in, within Northern Ireland or in fact leaving Northern Ireland. Um, so the restrictions were around um, incoming travellers from places outside the common travel area. Does that answer your question, yeah. Jerry? Thank you. Yeah. So could you just go back to your first question? Yeah. I wasn't quite question clear what is, you were asking there. In relation to the bars, um, and one of the bars that's been mentioned by um, others, uh, sunflower bar are being told that the reason why they they can't open is because they have four walls um and, and that um seems perplexing um they have an outdoor facility as, as the other bars and other restaurants um so so is there a discrepancy in the law to say that some um walls are safer than others not to be facetious but um there seems to be something really uh, amiss uh, some some gaps in the legislation and and they're sort of puzzled as are others uh, and, and and so am i thanks jerry that that's helpful that does clarify the question and, and marion's going to answer that for you hey uh, um so jerry in terms of smoke-free legislation um for an outdoors for it to be outdoors and allow smoking um, it needs to be 50% open under that legislation and because under these regulations um, enclosed or substantially enclosed is coming under them regulations, it means that any of these outdoor areas still have to be 50% open. Does that make sense? Does that? Uh, just sorry for my own ignorance, could you really explain what 50% what open would entail in an outdoor facility? Like you say, and um, four walls there, so that would have to still be fifty percent open. You know, say two two openings at each side, and maybe you know a, a roof opening. Um, that would be up to, I'd say, environmental health would um, determine that. You know, going, going by the look of it. Um, but 
that's where that comes in in terms of the four walls where they would be determining if it's 50% open under that legislation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And going into Pam Cameron, go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to, I think it's Liz, isn't it? And to, to Marianne there for um, the, some of the clarity coming through, uh, in particular to the, the issue around those um, stop who have now come across serious problems and feel that they're now not going to be able to open tomorrow. I think it is very worrying and I share Carol's concern around the, the staffing issue and, and those that have maybe come off furlough and will not be able to go back on because they've actually changed jobs. Uh, I think it is a real issue and I would back that call to um, to write to uh, the Executive Office to try and get clarity on some kind of resolution if that's possible. But just for absolute clarity, can you tell us um, are you are you saying that the problem is actually enforcement in terms of the, uh, the smoke-free legislation and that actually what has happened, I, I'm taking from what you've said, that what has actually happened is that the establishments who opened previously in COVID actually should not have been allowed to open the last time. And, and that's why now they, they are encountering, encountering these problems. Um, I guess what I'm saying from the point of view of the regulations, the position is consistent with the way it was last year. Um, in terms of individual enforcement decisions and operational decisions, I can't comment on those, but I do know, as you've all articulated, that a problem has emerged this week and it, it is being discussed for sure, um, because it, it's causing significant um, uh, disturbance. So um, it, your point is noted on that. But in terms of the regulations, that there's consistency with the situation as it was last year. Okay, um, thank you for that, Liz. I suppose just a final comment on that. Obviously, communication is obviously has become a real issue here uh, between um, departments and uh, enforcement um, from, from councils and environmental health or whatever. So I think clarity needs to be sought in this very, very urgently uh, to, address it, to address the problem, if at all possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pam. And going in finally on this to Jonathan Buckley. Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and I would concur absolutely with the previous members in relation to their comments surrounding the differential between councils, uh, which does cause for a lot of confusion, not only to businesses, but indeed also to those that are, are using these facilities. Um, Liz, are we in a place now to maybe give a wee bit more clarity as around the wording of Stay Local? I know I quizzed you about this last week. You said there was conversations ongoing. Um, could you maybe give me an update? Uh, my update is that it is uh, being discussed in the executive um, today. That's the update I have for you. Liz, um, and I'm not, I'm not here to shoot you as a messenger, definitely not. But that is the exact quest, or that is the exact answer I was giving last week. You know, this is moving on. Stay local needs to be clarified. People need to know exactly what they can and cannot do. I welcome the fact it's moving in the right direction, but we need to be clear on the messaging. Well, well, I don't disagree with you on that, um, and that is why it has been um, tabled for discussion today. Okay, so you don't disagree with me on it. Uh, you've obviously fed in exactly what we said at the last week's committee meeting. What was the response to those in which you fed it into as to what the message meant? Look, I, I'm, this is something that I am leading this discussion on for the, all of the departments and the executives. So I, I'm not able to answer that directly to you today, but I can assure you that it is under discussion at the moment, and there will be clarity on it. Okay, Liz, you've told me you're leading on it, so therefore you should be able to answer my question. 
when you reported back to the center as to what the stale local message meant, you said that yes, this was a concern last week, that you were getting clarity on it. We're now a week on later. You would have known that I was going to come back to ask the question. What was the response? The response is in the form of a paper that is being discussed today by the executive. That is what I can say. Okay, I, I, I'll not continue on that line of question, but I have to say I'm disappointed. You know, it's a clear question, it's a genuine question. You know, we're, we're moving through these regulations, parts of our economy are reopening, and the key message being put out by the executive and being reinforced by its officials at the committee, and we can't even get a definition. I don't think that's good form. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. And I suppose that that also raises the question. Um, that that also raises the question, Liz, in terms of messaging and measures and all of that. We have been, I suppose, conscious that uh, living here on a on a relatively small island, a single epidemiological unit, has there been any consideration? If we are looking at the message, has there been any consideration? And indeed, the measures that that the, that the messaging relates to, has there been any consideration given to how we can? harmonize that around say potentially using county boundaries using provincial boundaries using local government is is that a part of the consideration here as to how we better coordinate our efforts with the south and and try to iron out and reduce the uh, the potential for varying levels of transmission continuing to create problems for all of us is that part of the consideration in the messaging well, it's, it's obviously a, a very important point, and it is the subject of, um, of many uh, considerations and discussions ranging from uh, chief medical officers right down to uh, the public health uh, officials on the ground on either side of the border. Um, I think it's your, your, what you've opened up there is so much bigger than these regulations and the purpose of our attendance today. So if you would like more information about that, I'm sure we can arrange a session for this to be discussed. But I think this discussion today is about two amendments to the restrictions regulations. Um, so I'm happy to take any further questions on those. Okay, and, and I and I do appreciate I do appreciate that that uh, this is a bigger conversation. However, I suppose what I would say is in general is that. Um, we all understand that, that, that mistakes can be made, and this all came very, very as an unprecedented situation. But as we go forward, I think we want to see continuous improvement and that mistakes are not repeated, and that as we as we build in improvements, we take that that more holistic approach into sure. consideration. So I'm going to go, um, Jonathan, I'm going to go to Kara Hunter. I'm going to go to Kara Hunter first. Thank you. Go Chair. ahead, Kara. Um, Thank you, Chair. And I'm just in agreement with other members uh, and their previous comments. I think that the point that Jonathan has raised around stay local, uh, it's entirely vague. It's open to interpretation. And certainly in the more kind of touristy areas, such as the North Coast or during Morning Down, um, we do see an influx of people. So I think a strength around the stay local message would be helpful um, and clarification on that is much needed. Um, this may have been mentioned um, by other um, uh, members of the committee, but can I just ask again what conversations you're having with uh, as officials with uh, local councils to ensure it's equal right across the board? Because I do note with hospitality in my own constituency, um, I think there's a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, and a lot of resentment. Um, that it seems very strange that this time last year they were allowed to open in the same circumstances, and yet this year it seems a lot more strict. And I, I note the hospitality have been very patient. Um, they, they've followed every rule in the book uh, within guidance and uh, I think you know they've invested a lot of time money uh, into ensuring the arrangements outdoors are suitable and then now we're hearing last minute um, that there's enforcement and issues um, so just some feedback on you and what conversations you've had with council I, I would find very helpful thank you there have been, uh, I think I've described before, we, we discuss things with them every week in the cross-departmental meetings that are chaired by the executive office. Uh, the councils are represented there as a PSNI. There were specific discussions about this held um, on the 21st of April. I wasn't personally involved in that. You can imagine that this is a very um, uh, broad piece of work. There's a range of, of, of people involved. 
Um, the meetings involved uh, our department, communities, economy, um, tourism NI, councils, PSNI to discuss this issue and absolutely those discussions will be resumed um, and, and almost certainly are. I might not just know exactly uh, the detail of what's going on there today um, to try to address the issues that have come up. Okay, thank you. I just think as we move forward and, you know, our, our economy does open up again, I just think it's important the department uh, is very clear um, with the relevant kind of sectors on what, what will be expected, what rules they need to abide by, and then also just be mindful. Um, I know this week I've had a number of constituents so confused uh, as we approach as the regulations and guidance changes what it means for them, what they can and cannot do. So I just think it's important that we keep communication clear from the department uh, as the guidance changes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jara. And a very brief point then, Jonathan, please. It's just developing on your concept there, which I think is important about, you know, being clear about all of this. And I think Cara ha has nailed it on too. Can I just for clarity ask, so when we put these questions to you, Liz, what do you then do with them? Who, who do you, as taking the lead on this, who do you feed them to? And then how do those conversations make their way to executive ministers for their opinion. Well, I've explained to you already that we have um, regular cross-departmental catch-ups um, on this and uh, the, the, the issues raised by you obviously inform those discussions. And as I've explained to you, they are appearing today in an, in an executive paper that, in fact, was tabled before, um, and, and those meetings didn't happen. Uh, but it has it has been um, on the agenda. Um, the, the, the question that you raised, particularly about um, what stay local means, and uh, the, these issues are actively discussed amongst the myriad of other things that uh, myself and other officials who are mired in this are talking about on a regular basis. Also, um, as you have followed up some of these in writing, we are preparing a response to your letter. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, okay thank you. And uh, thank you, Liz and Marion. I don't see any other indications. Thank you for coming on there to, to address those questions. And uh, uh, clearly, there, there is a need, I suppose, for everyone involved here in drawing up these, these regulations to ensure that they're being implemented fairly and in a consistent way right across, right across the areas. And, and supporting business to ab to abide by the regulations, but also that the regulations make sense in terms of consistency. So thank you for that, and we'll continue on with our consideration. But I think that that's okay for now from from yourselves. Thank you. So members, there's been a proposal there that we ask that we write uh, urgently to TEO for clarity around the situation that has arose. Are members content that we do that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, members. So I'm going to move on then to the formal consideration of each of them in turn. So item seven there is SR 2021 forward slash nine three. Uh, that SR is the consolidation of coronavirus restrictions legislation. The examiner of statutory rules. I'll just I'll just go over this for members' information again. The examiner of statutory rules has asked the department to make amendments to this SR to provide clarifications around the closure of listed business or relevant retail businesses. In addition, the examiner has requested that the department provides a link to the guidance on funerals in the regulations to improve accessibility. The department has confirmed that it will make these amendments at the earliest opportunity. So members have raised further significant issues in relation to the statutory rule, and, and we have agreed that we will write urgently to the, we, to the uh, TEO in relation to that. If there aren't any further issues, then can I ask members to agree? And I don't see any further indications. If can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations NI 2021 and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly? Are we agreed? Chair, sorry, Chair, can I come in? Sorry, it's not just TEO, it's come back to the Department for Health. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, just to clarify that as to both departments as a matter of urgency. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's well made. So can I ask the members, uh, are we agreed? Yeah, members agreed, thank you. Item 8 then is SR 2021 forward slash 97. 
the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Regs NA 2021. These SRs provide for some easements of the restrictions. They permit click and collect services. They remove restrictions on movement and allow 10 people to meet outdoors at a private dwelling and allows for the reopening of certain business. The examiner of statutory rules has no issues to raise with this SR. And again, members have raised significant issues today and have agreed to write to both the, the executive office and the department in relation to concerns we have around the interpretation and implementation of these rules. However, uh, if there are no other issues to raise, I would like to ask members that we to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Regulations 2021 and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Yep, members are agreed. Thank you, members. Okay, members, uh, moving on then to item 10, which is in relation to the committee inquiry on COVID-19 and its impact on care homes. Um, 12.34. I'm just going to take a very short break before we come to this item, just to allow members a comfort break, um, and we'll resume there. 12.34. Could we come back at 12.45, members, to resume on this item of business? Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, Clark, can you take us out of broadcasting temporarily, please? That's a slide now, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, members, so we're moving on then to item 10, which is our committee inquiry, which was COVID-19 and its impact on care homes. Can I ask all members uh, to make sure that you're on mute? And if you have a hand raised from the last session, uh, just, just take that down so I can see hands raised again for the session. Um, so the departmental response to the committee's inquiry report has now been received. A short summary of the department's response is in your table papers, packed there at 10.2. Members will have noted that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the committee's recommendations have been accepted or partially accepted by the department. Um, so hopefully members have had a chance to have a look over that. Uh, what are members' views in relation to what they have seen there within the department response? Um, yeah, I see Carol indicating, and if other members, Jonathan, your hand is up. I'm not sure if that's from previous, but I see your hand is up there, Jonathan. So, um, just just I'll, I'll check with you. So, Carol, and then I see Jerry, Carol. So, go ahead, Carol, let it hold her dice. Um, Gourmet Ocket, sure. Um, so I appreciate I wasn't here when the, the the inquiry happened, but um, I think we need a bit more um uh, of a response back from a department. So, you know, what does partially accepted mean? Um, what is, why is it not accepted? Um, and basically, um, you know, some of the issues such as were raised were are far, still, in my opinion, um, very um, topical. Uh, but certainly I, I think just going by the response, it's very scant. And given the brevity of the inquiry, I think we need a bit more information and clarification on that. Sure, it's just my own instinct. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would agree in that I'm, I'm particularly disappointed, I have to say, around the discharge policy one. I think that was a, a, an area of particular concern for the committee. And I would like to know more about the reasoning behind it. I note the testing one as well. We were we were looking for further resilience within the local testing. So it may it may be useful maybe to look at maybe asking for the department to provide a briefing. Maybe and maybe maybe we could look at doing um, like a lunchtime session or something to get to get further details. And I know we're under significant pressure of work, but I think it will be useful to go through the partially accepted as well to see why is it partially accepted, what's partially accepted, what's what's being proposed in place or, or whatever. So I think that'll be a useful discussion, but we'll come back to members to see. I, I, I do agree with that notion. Um, I'm going to Jerry Carroll. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I would agree with that suggestion from yourself as well. Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, you know, I think the first six recommendations um, they were accepted, but I know obviously the CUR um, partner scheme still hasn't been fully uh, implemented. Um, similarly, yourself, Chair, I'm still I'm concerned about some of the answers to the uh, discharge policy, um, and I think that most of those 
uh, areas have been partially um, accepted, if I uh, recall correctly. Uh, also concern about, um, sorry, bear with me, in response to the answer um, to the first six recommendations, um, there's a group in, uh, referred to by the department uh, moving towards normalised care home visiting um, uh, finished group. Uh, and there's no uh, union representation on that, so that's a, a, a concern. Um, uh, the the fact that the, the department is kind of partially accepting the um, the fact that patients should be tested before entering care homes um, again in, in another uh, pandemic or outbreak um, is very concerning, and to me suggests they're trying to see a face from their previous uh, error and they're unwilling to admit that that was an error, uh, which most people uh, have seen that it was. Um, and I think that's something that needs you know further uh, clarity on from, from their um, perspective. Um, and then just obviously, just one final point, sure. Um, the safe staffing obviously is, is referred to, uh, and I think it's... Um, accepted from the department but obviously there's no legislation uh, coming through so that's a um, a further um, concern um, and, and then just the um, the answer to so I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of recommendations obviously uh, an answer to recommendation 38 um, there's a, a you know from my perspective a, an evasive and a bit of a waffly answer to be blunt um, from the department around inspections, basically trying to downplay uh, the role of inspections. And obviously we all know uh, inspections can't uh, find everything, but they can obviously flag you know major uh, issues. Um, uh, and then obviously just finally, Chair, um, the recommendation 40 um, about improving uh, guidance um, uh, with unions. Uh, between car homes, um, there's nothing really in from the department's point of view about tackling uh, owners who refuse to let people join a union or uh, unions end the union. Day. So, um, just a few few general points on that. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Your hand is raised. Can I check is that in relation to this se section? I'm not hearing from Jonathan there, so I'm going to move on to Pam, whose hand is also raised, and I'll go back to Jonathan. Go ahead, Pam, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I suppose it's it's good we've got a, a detailed response from the Minister, that's the first thing, um, and it, it does certainly outline a, a willingness uh, within the Department to accept most of the recommendations. I think for, as a committee, I would like us to be looking at um, you know, putting in some kind of performance framework on this uh, to ensure that there's kind of rolling scrutiny going forward and that we can, you know, we can kind of tick off which recommendations have cut, you know, come to pass and, and what hasn't and so we can keep a good eye on this going forward I think it's too important to just um, dismiss as dealt with um, at this point I think uh, there's a there's a lot of um, issues that are too important so I think we obviously we'll, we'll have further opportunities in the Minister come before us again too to ask questions around this for you know some of the issues we feel are too important to be dismissed or rejected um, but I, I would like to see some kind of performance framework, if that's the right terminology, put in place so that we can just kind of keep a, a, an eye on, on where the department has, has gotten on, on each of the recommendations. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pam. I'm going to check back then briefly with Jonathan. Jonathan, do we have Jonathan online, Clerk? And uh, can you check if, uh, if his hand is still raised from previously, um, which I think is the case? It's still raised from previous. I think he, he's just thought of his desk at the minute, I think. Okay. Okay, members, so there's two, there's two, I suppose, uh, proposals there that we asked the department to come and, and go through in some more detail, the uh, the recommendations that have been partially accepted or not accepted as to the rationale of that, and also the deputy chair's uh, suggestion there that we put in place a series of maybe review meetings or, or uh, monitoring in, in a sense that we can ourselves see, track this through the implementation by the department, and maybe, maybe we can schedule that after we do the meeting with the department to, to glean a bit more detail at this point. Are members content with both of those suggestions? Yeah. Okay, members, so, uh, and, and Clerk, that may be the case that we may maybe want to do a lunchtime meeting or something like that with the department just to not uh, disrupt the, the, the quite intensive work that we all have ongoing. I think it'll be maybe a useful format for that. 
Okay, thank you, members. Moving on then to correspondence, item 11. So uh, there's a couple of items, uh, that, uh, a number of items that I'd like to draw your attention to, and then I will go to members for a for their comments on any items of correspondence. We'll deal with the main pack first, and then anything that's in table papers, I'll come to a separate and a discrete section on that if, if members want to raise issues of correspondence in, that are in the table papers. So the first one that I want to flag today is item 11.2, which is the outcome of the consultation on the establishment of a regional care and justice campus for children and young people. This is a joint piece of work taken forward by the Departments of Health and Justice. The Committee for Justice have got in touch to suggest a joint briefing from officials on that work. Um, have members any comments or would members be content with that approach? Go ahead, Carol. No, just said that's dead on. Yeah, thank you. And I think every all the other members are content with that. So if so, then the clerk will, uh, clerk, can you kindly liaise with the Justice Committee to identify possible dates for a joint briefing? Yeah, thank you, clerk. Item 11.6 is the Department of Health's views on the damages return on investment bill. So uh, that's also linked to Committee for Justice. Have members any comments in relation to that item? No. Okay, are members then content to write to the Committee for Justice to outline that it is content with the Department's response? Yeah, thank you, members. Item 11.7 is a response from the Department to the Committee's request for further information following the briefing on the hyponatremia-related deaths work programme. Have members any comments in relation to this item? Chair, sorry. Ahead, Chair. Um, so uh, th this is in relation to... Uh, the perm sec coming in front of the committee, is it? Um, well, that, that, that's a separate item issue, I think, Clark. Can I just check that, 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 the, uh, that the, this is separate to the briefing from the permanent secretary? Sorry, Chair, this letter just is a, is a response to some of the issues that were raised and it mentions the perm sec. So um, the next line of the brief was just to outline that we scheduled that briefing. Okay. Um, for the 27th of May. Thank you. Okay, so members therefore content to note pending that briefing that the clerk has confirmed from the Permanent Secretary on the 27th of May. Members content to note in the meantime. Thank you. Item 11.14 is from the Children's Law Centre regarding the Department's proposal to extend some of the provisions of the Children's Social Care Coronavirus Temporary Modification of Children's Social Care Regulations. Members will recall that the Department advised that it's carrying out a brief consultation in this proposal and that the committee sought the view of, we, we also separately sought the view, our own view of the Children's Law Centre on that matter. Um, so any comment from members in relation to this? I, I was wondering in relation to this, would members be content to be right to the Department to request that this regulation comes in as an SL1 in the first instance? And I think this where people are particularly vulnerable, I think, in relation to children's regulations, and we have, we have welcomed some of the uh, uh, improvements in relation to the mental health regulations, but I think these key ones in particular would benefit from going back to a more normal process so we can engage properly with the department. So would members be content in relation to the children's that we request that that, that comes as an SL1? Go ahead, Pam. Yeah, Chair, yeah, thank you. Members are indicating um, agreement. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, are, are we going to send this letter off to the department to, for them to um, get the, that detail as well so that they can answer some of the concerns that have been raised? Sorry, Pam, just can you clarify that? I didn't quite pick up what, you, what you're asking there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, are we going to be forwarding the, the letter to the department oh, okay. so they can answer some of the concerns raised? Well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I'd agree and I see a lot of members agreeing as well. Yeah. So we we'd forward the letter to the department and ask them to respond to the concerns raised. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, members. Are members otherwise content then with the main uh, any other proposals? Yes. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. And Carol yeah. next. Just just Jerry on uh, eleven point three, the correspondence um from the minister and uh, releasing the solace and kids together a, a group in, in my constituency. Um, and it's just, I find that, I mean, the, the answer is quite short and um, disappointing in some ways because it basically says that the, the organisation um, isn't getting access to 
community involvement sector funding uh, this year, uh, but there's a new stream uh, next year. And given what we've heard about all the pressure on uh, the community involvement sector and organisations and the challenges they face, I don't believe that's that's good enough for this and, and other organisations who are falling outside the, the remit of funding. So just to express my, my disappointment on it, I've no proposal uh, necessarily around it, uh, but I'm happy if others do. Uh, but I don't think that really... Um, you know, deals uh, adequately with, with what this organisation uh, needs, uh, and it's a very you know important and, and worthwhile organisation, as, as many others are, out there are. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, going to Carol, and then Paula. Yeah, Go ahead, sure. Carol. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I would support um, Jerry's call because the kids together actually deals right, maybe based in West Belfast, deals with kids from right across the boards and. You may remember I raised this before, but one of the, the other issue, and I don't know what stage has come at, Chair, so apologies, I've had a, a bad IT malfunction, but I want to come back to um, reproductive health care for women in the Western Trust as well, about the withdrawal of some of the services. So I don't know what stage, I'm just looking at your guidance here because I can't, I'm trying to look at papers on my phone and I'm not having much success. Well, if we if we if we bring that any other business, maybe we'll raise that in any other business. Then I suggest, and we'll continue. We'll complete the correspondence initially. Okay, um, okay. That 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 point is is uh, noted in relation to your the concerns around solace and kids together. Any other uh, items of correspondence in the main pack that members wish to raise? Sorry, Chair. Chair, I was to come in. Oh, on that. Yes, you were. You were indeed okay. called. Sorry. Go no, ahead. I was just going to echo. Um, Solus operate in South Belfast, and they provide amazing services um, to families and, and, and the young people. And I thought that it was a bit of a sweeping um, bad away, considering how much um, they have contributed and what they put on during the pandemic. I mean, I think it was quite insulting, actually, the response. So I'm just not sure what we can do as a follow up. Um, you know, a year away, some of these organisations, especially Solus, they may have to close down some programs because they don't have the grant fund. I think they've probably 20 live grant funds and no organisation should have to deal with that. So I, I, I would like to go back around to try and get a bit more clarity on what funding the department is providing for autism services in the, the community involvement sector, because I, th I don't think that that was a good enough response given the, the, the need, the acute need across the city and beyond. Yeah, so members are content. To, I, I think we actually have, a, I'll just check with the clerk, we may have a detailed request in with the department already around autism, but I'm not sure if it includes community community services. So I'll just check with the clerk on that. Yes, sir, we do have a letter in, but we can follow up on that particular issue and ask for, uh, I suppose, a fuller response. Okay, so members content with that, yeah. Thank you. Members, okay, and then uh, any other items of correspondence that members wish to raise or draw attention to? No, thank you. So, uh, are members then otherwise content with the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Yep, members are content. Moving on to table papers then, uh, the table pack contains a number of further items of correspondence and I would draw members' attention to uh, one of them there, which is 11, item 11.49. Um, that is correspondence from an individual on a public interest disclosure in relation to the Western Trust. The committee had previously written to the department on this issue and were content with the response received in December 2020. Um, are members content to note or have members any other comments in relation to that piece of correspondence? Members content to note? Yeah, okay, thank you. Moving on then to the Forward Work Programme, I refer members to the Draft Forward Work Programme at tab 12.1 of the pack. Are members content to note the Forward Work Programme as presented there? Yep, members content. And just, I want to draw attention to a Mental Health Week, which is the week after next. We have a, a, a very, I think, a important programme of events lined up and a very important focus, actually in, in quite timely in a sense, that we have a very important focus on children and young people, given the issues around autism that have been mentioned today, given the issues around CAMS that have, have been mentioned today, and indeed community services, all, all very much trying to address this, uh, this uh, significant and worrying issue. So if we could just ask maybe the clerk to outline the draft programme for that week so that members have a, a kind of a, a steer on what we're, what we're all, what we have arranged for the Mental Health Week. 
Go ahead, start, please. The thing, the thing, sure. Just the the outline of what the, the plan is for that week. Um, at the minute, we've got a committee motion promoting mental health week. Um, at the start of that week, I've just confirmed the day, um, whether it's going to be the Monday or, or, or Tuesday. Um, then the formal committee meeting on Thursday, we have a briefing from the minister on mental health, and then we have a joint briefing from the children's commissioner and from the mental health champion. Um, we then have a number of informal events. I, I will get the, the dates and times issued out to you. On the Wednesday evening, um, our engagement team have put together an event with young people from a, a number of different groups um, to discuss mental health and wellbeing. Um, and then we've two other informal sessions, um, like they'd be um, Wednesday morning and Friday afternoon. One is with the 123 GP group, um, which is about mental health services and GP practices. Um, and the other is with the mental health policy group, which is um, a group of four different organizations, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the British Psychological Society, Northern Ireland branch, Inspire Wellbeing and Action Mental Health. So we're still finalizing w when they will come, whether it's on the Wednesday morning or Friday afternoon, but I will get that calendar um, out to you. Also, it was mentioned earlier about the possibility of getting the trusts along the brief, so I will have a look at that and see what we can um, schedule. If, if not, certainly that week, as close to that week as possible. Um, so I'll get that issued out to members after today, just so you can start um, checking your diaries for, for, for those events. And I will confirm the date of the committee motion as well. Um, it's like I said, it's likely to be um, hopefully Tuesday the 11th. Um, there might be a chance we might have to do it the following week, but um, we're hoping that it'll be on Tuesday the 11th of the, the week of mental health week or Mental Health Awareness Week, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions on any of that, members? No. Okay, thank you. And thank you, uh, Clerk, and thank you to the entire team there for pulling all that together. There's a substantial piece of work involved there, I have to say. May I'm particularly looking forward to the engagement with young people directly. I think that's that's a really great opportunity for us to hear directly from those young people about, about the impact all of COVID has had and lack of uh, provision and access to services is having more generally. Um, Paula, I do see a hand raised there from yourself. For, for any other business, please, Chair. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think members are content with that mental health. So, moving into other, any other business, and Carol, you have raised an issue there. Go ahead, and then I'll go to Paula. Yeah, sure. It was just, you know, I mean, if there's removal of any other services by any trust, there'll be an explanation. So, um, I just think we need to, I mean, it's completely appropriate for this committee to ask what is happening with those health and social care services for women in that trust area. Okay. Um, and and would you be, that, that'd be right to the trust and the department asking yeah. for an explanation as to that and what is being done to address? Is that the proposal? Are members yeah. content? Are right? Content, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Content, content, yeah. And Paula, um, then go ahead, Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, like many others on the call today, I've had my first um, fact seat and, and the system went really well. But I just, unfortunately, one issue has been brought to my attention, and that was from a constituent who requires his communication to be provided in Braille. Um, when he went along to the um, vaccine centre and asked for the information that we've all, those of us have a vaccine, um, could he have it in Braille? He said, it's not available. And he, he was a wee bit annoyed and upset. Um, and he said, you know, he sort of raised a complaint and he said, well, I'd like to issue a complaint or submit a complaint. And so he, again, he was offered um, some correspondence or a leaflet that was just um, in print. Um, so I suppose it's something that we could maybe write to the department and raise this issue that there will be people coming forward for the vaccination who do have sight loss and require the information in Braille, Minister, Chairman. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Paul, and that's useful. And I wonder, could I possibly add to that a concern that I have uh, encountered 
across a number of areas and, and a few people that we're working with in relation to access to guide dogs for the blind and other services for people who are sensorily deprived um, as a result of COVID. There's been a horrendous, I wonder, uh, could, it, could we include in that asking the department to outline what additional supports they are, they are putting in place to uh, protect people in light of the impacts that there have been? Sure. Yeah. And, and, and the clerk has pointed out that we will have Patricia Donnelly next week as well, so we could raise the issue. But I think it's worth writing on both those issues, and I think the committee are in agreement with that. Um, Jerry, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, Jerry. Just, just following on, because um, I don't think I've received the correspondence. Apologies if I have, but uh, Cambys Committee asked for um, is the Royal Society for uh, the Blind, is it, if that's the correct organisation, or whomever it is, to, to find out sort of what challenges they face, because I was kind of a similar issue to Paula was raised with myself. Um, not sh- not too sure if it, if it was the same case or not, but I imagine people uh, here playing and partially say it have a lot of difficulties. But um, I haven't really uh, had much correspondence from the organisation, so if we could maybe go out of our way as a committee to, to contact them, um, I think that would be uh, useful if, if we can. Yeah, yeah, because because I I am aware that there were you know there there are a number of issues where working dogs have reached the end of their working life and have had to be removed from from the assistance of the blind person but nothing has been in place to to so i think that's that's a useful engagement we could ask them to uh, illustrate and and amplify any of the issues that they're encountering and then we'll, we'll at least have some awareness of that so clerk if we could ask the uh, the royal institute for the blind to uh, to to give us a, a written briefing on relation to their issues i think that's the proposal sure. yeah, Carol? Can, and I know it's just it's slightly different, but it's still problematic. Um, could we ask about singers and support for the deaf and partially hearing as well? I mean, I went to the SS Arena, um, and I have to say it was absolutely fantastic the way the layout was. Um, but I could see, I could see if there were people had different challenges around their hearing, it would be difficult for them. Yeah, yeah, no, my proposal was actually we asked around all the sensory, um, all the sensory deprived areas. I think it would be useful if the department could give us some indication on how they're, how they're supporting that, those people. Okay, members, um, Chat Palm, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Yes, I, I also wanted to um, speak to the deaf community as well, and it's something um, we've actually written to the, to the speaker in the assembly. As, uh, as a subject as well, because obviously um, for the deaf community, their English uh, is not a first language. Uh, so, I mean, I think there, I, I've had too much communication with the deaf community uh, in my constituency, and it's actually very, very difficult to communicate, even, you know, in the written word, because English is not a first language signing is. So uh, it requires interpretation, even on a constituency, um, side of things, uh, in terms, uh, and it is very, very difficult. So there is much frustration out there about the lack of provision to to very basic communication that we all need, especially as we're going through this pandemic. I think it's really highlighted um, how how little um, there is in terms of real effort to communicate with 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 people who have no other way of of, of getting that really vital. Um, information and that's across all the departments so I, I think it, it it's a it's a much bigger subject so I'm glad mm-hmm. we are talking about today and I think it's appropriate that we do, that we do try and act on that yeah thank you thank you members I do think that is a useful and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a very uh, a, a crucial area of uh, of attention for us. so so thank you for that okay members thank you uh, for today the uh, just moving on to date time and place of our next meeting. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, 6th of May at 9.30 a.m. via video link. Um, there has been an uh, email circulated to members. I had asked the clerk to prepare a discussion document around the virtual and, and the impact of, of virtual, how we can better manage that in, in light of and in respect of uh, both abiding by the, uh, the, the restrictions, the regulations, but also demonstrating good practice ourselves and applying that that a uh, good practice to ourselves as well so i'd ask the clerk to pre- to present a sort of a, a a discussion document for you all and that has been emailed out to you so thank you clerk thank you to all of the clerking staff as ever it doesn't always get said but we always do appreciate the work that goes behind every one of these meetings in terms of preparation and follow-up
which is, which is massive as well. And once again, this has been a very heavy meeting in that respect. And uh, the clerk and his staff then have to deal with all those additional requests. So we appreciate that and I want to pass that on on behalf of the committee. So thank you, members. Next meeting, Thursday, 6th of May at 9.30 a.m. via video link. Gormay Agav, Agus Begi, Slam. Take care. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.